Welcome to the Board of Education's board meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provision article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matters that affect one or more specific individuals to also perform administrative functions and to consult with counsel. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We will see you back here at 6 p.m. Hi, Ms. Nett. We got to get moving quick. I said I <laughs> Was about. about this was about yeah. us talking hey, to them about <coughs> I don't know but we got to get moving okay we will all right welcome everyone Sharon starts right yeah I start Sharon Welcome to the March 7th Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV Channel 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the excuse me, information table, and during this time we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations and comments outside the meeting room. We will now stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'd like to welcome everyone this evening to our meeting and to our county commissioner, uh, Mr. Steve Wilson. Thank you for coming. Um, now we will move on with the approval of the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Approval of the minutes for February 7th closed. May I have a motion to approve the open and closed minutes from February 7th, February 14th, and February 21st. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. At this time, we're going to move on to the recognitions and ask Dr. Kane to lead us at this time. Absolutely. Come on down. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's so good to see everybody out today. We got a full house, and that's just wonderful. We have uh, tonight some very special recognitions, as we always do on our board meeting nights. Uh, we'd like to express our appreciation and our thanks for the efforts of all of our talented students and staff, and in addition, the folks who will be recognized tonight. So we'll start with our Energizer Bunny Award. So I'm going to ask uh, Chip and Wayne to come forward, please. The Energizer Bunny Award recipient tonight goes to uh, is Ms. Scotta Higdon. Uh, she is, yes. Where is Ms. Higdon? There she is. She has a new role this year, and that is one of teacher specialist, and she is at Mattapique Middle School. However, she's done a phenomenal job acclimating to her new position. Um, she jumps right in, she takes charge, goes above and beyond every single day. Ms. Higdon works tirelessly with her team to create a culture of learning and advocacy for all of her students. She's a lifelong learner, working hard to learn more about her content and testing as well. 
and she's taking leadership to the next level as she continues to grow in her field. Ms. Higdon does not hesitate to assist administrators in whatever needs to be done at the school, as well as participating in the leadership role at the district level with the Innovation Center. So thank you for that work. Her energy and enthusiasm um, are nonstop and contagious. She works tirelessly to ensure that the job gets done to perfection. Ms. Higdon is our Energizer Bunny at Mattapique Middle School, and we feel extremely fortunate to have her on, her, uh, on the team. And continue to spread your energy, Ms. Higdon. Thanks for all that you do. Congratulations. So we want to recognize the folks that are here tonight to uh, support Ms. Higdon. I have my husband. Um, and I have half my children. <laughs> so s s stand up, come forward, please. And then, of course, I have support from my school. I have Dr. McCoy, Kayleen. Come Jane. on down. I have everybody from the school. Come on up, guys. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Our next award is the Shining Star Award recipient, and it goes to Mrs. D Nina Dixon. She is a shining star at Mattapique Middle. Would you please come forward, Ms. Dixon? Mrs. Dixon is kind, patient, and caring with all of the students. She spends many hours working very hard with both general and some students who receive special education services and their teachers to ensure the needs of all the students are met. She does not hesitate to participate in trainings, to increase her level of skill, to assist with programming for our special needs students. She goes above and beyond every single day to help students succeed. Mrs. Dixon's positive attitude truly shines through each and every day. Congratulations to you, Ms. Dixon, for being one of Queen Anne County Public Schools' finest. Keep shining. Next is Queen Anne's County Hero Award recipient, and that goes to Otto Jacobs. Otto Jacobs, please stand up, come forward. Otto is a hero at Mattapique Middle School. He's an eighth grade student. Um, and Otto's three years at Mattapique, he has displayed a gentle, caring, kind, and understanding attitude toward the students who receive special education services in the life skills program, which has been more noticeable than any other student. Otto spends his time during breakfast sitting and visiting with students about video and talking about video games and other common interests. Otto is quick to introduce his friends to others to ensure that all students feel welcome and included. Well well done, Otto. It is not uncommon for Otto to stop in the life skills classroom to serve as a role model when the teachers are introducing a new concept to their students. Otto has a huge heart and definitely stands out as a hero in the eyes of special needs students and the staff. Thank you, Otto, for being a positive role model. Mattapique Middle School is proud to call you one of their very own. Congratulations to you, Otto. Everyone is so very proud of you, and you continue to be a hero.
have with you? Uh, I have my my mom. Um, She's trying to get a camera. My, <laughs> my grandmother and my grandfather. Please come forward. Next, we have the Difference Maker Award. The Difference Maker Award is given to Mrs. Jacqueline Bailey. Ms. Bailey, please stand up and come forward. <laughs> Ms. Bailey was nominated by Savannah Gambrel, a student at Mattapeak Middle. Uh, Mrs. Bailey has made a positive difference in my life, says um, Savannah. She is a really nice teacher who cares about each and every student. She'll help a student when needed and challenges you when needed also. She's helped me to understand books better by annotating them and finding the definitions of the annotations. She's also helped me to become a better writer, step by step. Mrs. Bailey tries to make class as fun as possible, but also you learn at the same time. She can be strict when needed, but always nice to everyone. One thing I personally like is that she never says you're completely wrong. She always says something like, I see how you saw it, and <laughs> understands different views. She takes it in ideas from students, and when grading doesn't look at, uh, and when she's grading, she doesn't look at the names of students so that her grading is unbiased. Awesome, Mrs. Bailey. I think Miss Bailey is the teacher that has made a positive difference in my life. I can make a positive difference in many others' lives in the future. Thank you, Mrs. Bailey, for all the work you do with our students and being a difference maker. Congratulations. And next we have our Spirit Award recipient, and that goes to Miss Jen Dreyer. Miss Dreyer, would you please stand and come forward? Mrs. Dreyer is the Spirit Awardee for Mattapique Middle School. She's the reading specialist. She works extremely well with the instructional leadership team and spends countless hours not only supporting teachers with professional development and collaboration, but working with individual students to help improve their reading skills. Mrs. Dreyer participates in ongoing coordination with English language arts supervisors to ensure uh, or secure resources for our school and to ensure implementation of the reading program with fidelity. Mrs. Dreyer does an excellent job tracking data to demonstrate student progress and she makes adjustments to programming to meet the needs of all learners. Mrs. Dreyer's rigorous goals are incorporated into students IEPs. <laughs> Mrs. Dreyer is an invaluable asset to Mattapeak Middle School and we are fortunate to have a dedicated teacher like her who loves learning, loves helping others, and loves her job. Mrs. Dreyer does a phenomenal job every day with a warm smile on her face. And we hope that you keep up that spirit, Mrs. Dreyer, and we appreciate all that you do for the students and for the staff. Congratulations. You're welcome. And who do you have with you today? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, you have. You're missing two, so you've got a husband yes. and one, one, and you've got your principal and assistant <laughs> principal. <laughs> We have a very special award um, tonight that we are going to, in which we're going to recognize several of our students um, and some recognitions that happened because it's Black History Month, or it was last month. So I'm going to ask Ms. Janet Pauls, who should be in the audience someplace, to come forward. There she is back there. Come forward, please, Ms. Pauls. And there was a special recognition that we would certainly like for Ms. Pauls because she was uh, there a part of it and she has so much history for Queen Anne's County. If you would explain, and you certainly can uh, use the notes provided if you like. I think it's appropriate <laughs> to do that. Good evening, everyone. So on um, February the 17th, in honor of Black History Month, we had a special program at the Kennard Heritage Center. And if you have not had the opportunity to visit the center, please do so. We thought that it would be fitting to recognize many of the students that are in our schools. So with the community's help and with the principal's help, we recognized at least one to four students at each of our schools for their, and I'll read that piece of it, for their um, academic excellence. Uh, many of the students, almost all of the students have GPAs from 3.0 to 4.25 for their membership in National Honor Society, for participation in advanced placement classes, for their community involvement, and for special recognitions and honors that they have won. And then we told a little story about each of the children and they talked about their future aspirations. And right here in this room, we have future doctors, nurses, educators, a marine biologist, professional sports players, and a vet veterinarian. Um, we did also have several projects from the students. We had Andrew Wright, who was a kindergartner at Ken Island uh, Elementary School, sang a solo for us. We had Sakai Magwood, who is here with us uh, in the back. He is a junior at Queen Anne's County High School, who read a poem, Steal I Rise, by Maya Angelou. And then we had Craig Wright, who is also here, who shared his exhibit that he had done during the Social Studies Expo at Stevensville Middle School on conflict and compromise, slavery, and the Sugar Islands. And it was about the slave trade and sugar production in the Caribbean. We also honored, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Okay. We also honored some um, community members. We honored some first, the first teacher of the year, the first um, police officer, and the first um, board president who just happens, or member and president who just happens to be Craig Wright's grandfather. And we also did an honorary uh, recognition for Bishop Taylor as well during that time. Um, we, we presented a lot of history, and that history was on families in Queen Anne's County who had served in wars, the history of schools in Queen Anne's County, the role of the church, the African American church, and um, again, we honored all of our students pre-K to 12, so we had the full gamut of students and all of their accomplishments in the county. And it was just like it is today, standing room only. So it was very well done. Uh, the president of the association is Mr. Clayton Washington, and he is also here today. So thank you so much for coming. We had a great program, and hopefully next year you'll be able to join us. Thank you, Ms. Pauls. <clears throat> and so we are going to recognize our students at this time. And I realize, and you probably realize as well, that some of our students may not be here tonight, but we're going to call their name. I'm going to ask that if the students are here, that you would please come forward to receive a certificate that we prepare for you. Uh, and we'll just uh, line up as many as we can um, up here. And we might have to do this in shifts, Dr. Pearson, so that we can get photos photos and, um, and have enough room for everybody. So uh, if you would hold your applause to the end so that we can move forward. So first we have Journey Wilson. It's not here. Journey is not here. Thank you. She is, uh, uh, she is the, the basketball team one. Yes. And they had their championship playoffs. And Journey is a star player. So yeah. she couldn't be here with us tonight. <laughs> she, she, she was, yeah, she was busy. 
Zakai Magwood. Ariel Miles. Megan Hammond. Sierra Hines. Gabrielle Hazelwood, Is, no. Anaya Reed, Serenia Stowers or Stowers, Kyla Bordley, Cornelius Gaines. Lloyd Price, Craig Wright, Shania Tolson Rosa, Anna Reed, Kyla Reed, and I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly, and Layla Coles. Where is Layla's? Malena Fassett. Jamira Petty, Andrew Wright, Lee Rhodes, or Leah Rhodes, Willem Rhodes, and Isaiah Knowles. Now, let's give them one huge, rousing round of applause. Outstanding. Congratulations. I'd like to recognize um, Mr. Jack Wilson that snuck in while we were doing things. <laughs> nice to have you here, County Commissioner, and Sheriff Hoffman. Also, thank you for being here. Stevie Wilson. I'm missing something. Is we're doing the involvement, board member involvement, community involvement. Next page, number four. Okay.
Oh, that's after this. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, we're going to no, we're right here. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to uh, the participation of the uh, board members, uh, highlighting their community <coughs> involvement for the last month. I think we started over there last time. We'll start over here, Ms. Carey, <laughs> with you this time. Okay. Um, well, it's a busy month, and I attended quite a few things that I'm sure my fellow board members are going to share. I actually wanted to spend this time to highlight a future event um, that's going to occur on March 31st. It's the work of a, a woman named Kristen Weed here who does the Ken Island Beach cleanups. I've been following her work for a few years. Um, and what is fantastic about what I'm seeing right now is that it's intersecting with our school system. She actually has an intern program um, called Leaders in Training that grew from three interns last year to seven this year. And this is for our local high school students to develop their leadership skills. So the next beach cleanup is going to be on March 31st. Another cool thing that's going on with that group is that they applied for a grant and they received it. <coughs> and so the debris that's collected is going to be put together by a local artist. And this art piece will be displayed at all of our Queen Anne's County schools. Um, so I just want to highlight that because it's an upcoming event that people can put on their calendar. Um, I also had learned that the Queen Anne County High School Ladies Basketball achieved their first ever 2A regional title. And on Friday, they're going to be playing in Towson uh, for the next step toward the state champions. So I wanted to, to mention that. And one other thing that I wanted to use this time to mention that's important and dear to me is just the subject of mental health. Um, I think there's a lot of misperceptions about mental health and violence. And I just want to put it out there that those who are suffering from a mental health issue are more likely to be the victims of violence and not the <coughs> perpetrators. And the reason why I say this is because um, it's very important that we work to decrease stigma. We have a lot of young people in our school system that may feel as if they need some kind of treatment for an issue. And a big obstacle for them to getting that treatment is the stigma that's associated with mental health. So I um, feel that it's very important for us to all understand that violence does not equate to a mental health issue necessarily. Um, and that's all I really have to say. So thank you. thank you. It was a busy month. Um, I attended the Black History Month celebration at Kennard's Heritage Center. And it was quite an honor to be asked, invited to come, and to be part of such a great event. Um, also, I attended the County History Day competition, which was held at um, Queen Anne's County High School. And many of our students are moving on to states. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I know it's, it's double digits. Um, I also attended a, the Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner at Our Mother of Sorrows, which was organized by a, our speech pathologist at Centerville Elementary School, Belinda Bayshore. Many students participated in working that event. Um, of course, the Board of Ed budget meeting. Uh, one of our teachers at Church Hill Elementary School, Amanda Enzer, organized a special charity called the Moon Catcher Project. It was a paint night, and it benefited um, African American or no African <coughs> children in Uganda. So m primarily girls. Um, so it was a mother-daughter paint charity, which was really really fun. Um, I got to participate in eighth grade high school scheduling, which. Makes me a little nervous, but we did it. <laughs> uh, I plan on attending the, the Queen Anne's County High School Musical on Sunday. The District Band Festival will be held at Stephen Decatur High School. And um, my last thing is I just wanted to thank the bus drivers. We've had quite the crazy weather, and <laughs> trying to get our kids to and from school safely has got to be a really hard task, and they do it so well. <clears throat> And along with that, with the construction in Centerville, their route is not easy right now. So I want to just kind of shout out a great job for them. So that's what I've done. <laughs> um, nothing to report. <laughs> you had a quiet month? <laughs> Other than all the board things that we had. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I attended the, uh, and there were a couple of, uh, Sharon did too, the Teacher of the Year recognition for all the nominees at Fisherman's Inn. And so I just want to uh, congratulate all of them that were nominated. As you all probably read, we now we have three remaining finalists. But there were quite a few that had been nominated. And it was an event, a very nice event that I think Dr. Pearson set up with the Fisherman's Inn. 
So my shout out is really to Fisherman's Inn. They did all that, they did the food, they set it for no charge to the school system. So we appreciate that very much. Yes, from, so please go have a dinner at Fisherman's Inn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I also, there were several MAB legislative meeting, meetings going on because the General Assembly's in session. And um, I won't go over all the, there's a, a zillion bills that, that we're trying to uh, work through. Um, and and it's a, and there is an update on the website um, of that, um, on the MABES website. Um, also, there was a luncheon that um, I went to. It was a legislative luncheon, an annual luncheon. Um, unfortunately, uh, other board members weren't able to attend, but I did attend. Um, what I notice is every year there's a, there, that is a time where our legislators, as in, um, our, our delegates and can meet with the board and we can have mutual <coughs> discussions. So I'm going to try to encourage and, and also get it going for next year. To, and some of the school boards had their entire boards there and their legislators were all sitting at the table. And it made for a really nice, it's not a formal meeting, but it's a nice gathering for um, to kind of discuss um, things that are of importance to us. And that's held every year. So of all um, 24 districts attend with their a lot of their um, legislatures. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I had the honor on February 16th to um, be at the African American dinner at um, Sellersville Middle School. And on February 17th, along with Carrie and Jen, I also attended the Black History Celebration at the Kennard Heritage Center. And cannot say enough, if you have time, um, find the dates and visit that. It's really, it's quite awesome to see um, the school and how it's, it's been refurbished. And, and the program was wonderful, seeing all the children get their awards. And on uh, February 22nd, I attended the Multicultural Proficiency Community uh, Justice and Law Enforcement uh, meeting. And um, I think that was it for me. So at this time, we'll move on to Dr. Kane. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm not going to go through everything in the light of time because I know the time is getting away from us, but there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. Uh, I was able to attend a superintendent's conference in Nashville, AASA conference, and uh, thankfully I was able to get in on a session from the former superintendent from Newtown um, at Sandy Hook Schools So, and, and got some great tips from, from him. I attended the NAACP Youth Summit last month. I was unable to attend the African American program at the Kennard Heritage Center because of my travel, but I was able to go to the Youth Summit. It was very enlightening. Uh, I had a chance to talk with some of our students and um, have some conversations face to face with them regarding some things that they would like to see happen um, in terms of uh, our district being more inclusive for African American students and them being more proactive. So that was a very good uh, opportunity for me. Um, I attended the Kent Island New Beginnings Church uh, African American History Program and was able to accept on behalf of our school board an award. And this is uh, a tribute to the school board for all of the work and support that the board does to partner with the Kent Island New Beginnings Church. And so I'm going to give this to you, Madam DiMaggio, on behalf of uh, the church. It's and glass. Um, it's glass. You we got to look. We got. <laughs> <laughs> we got a box for Safety you. Box. And they've also presented um, nice. our school board with um, a couple of certificates. And one of the highlights was that we had the senator, a senator there. So we had Nathaniel, Senator Nathaniel McFadden there. And uh, he extends his, um, his gratitude to us. And... Um, presented a couple of certificates, and I'll read one of them. Certificate of Appreciation for Queen Anne's County Board of Education for indiscriminate and unwavering kindness in extending the use of the Graysonville Elementary School to the Kent Island New Beginnings Kajik family as a place of worship for the past seven years. This overwhelming support, concern, and care for their well-being as a community church with a mission for youth in the neighborhood is commendable. And it is signed Nathaniel McFadden. So there are two. Yep. And as a surprise to me, I was also awarded with um, a uh, award and certificate as well for um, being the first African-American superintendent in Queen Anne's County. So I am happy to accept that and I'm grateful for the partnership.
I was able to attend with Mr. Paluski or, or to visit Mr. with Mr. Paluski and Brad Engel, our supervisor for student support, uh, the virtual school in Frederick County. So Frederick County Public Schools has a virtual school. As you know, we have been talking about um, extending opportunities for our students for more online learning. And we're doing our homework right now. And hopefully next year, we'll be able to come back with a plan for how we might be able to extend more opportunities for our students in, in Queen Anne's County. So that was a very good visit. Visit. We also uh, visited their Career and Technology Center there as well. So uh, we'll share more about that at another time. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my team for, who accompanied me to the Kent Island um, New Beginnings Church, so that uh, the Black History Program. So Mr. Pender, Sid Pender was there, Janet Pauls was there, Dr. Pearson, Akita Pearson was there, as well as Miss Jackie Wright. So I thank each of them for supporting me and, and being there to accept that award on behalf of our, our school system and for our board. Also was able to attend um, an ESMIC, you know, the Eastern Shore Superintendents Group uh, legislative luncheon, had an opportunity to sit down with some of our lawmakers and, um, of course, Delegate Aaron, Stephen Aarons, he was there along with some others, so that was great. And just would like to um, really extend my thanks and, and, and just confirm our partnership. Our team is growing, our, my leadership team. There have been lots of events that have occurred over the last month or so, um, and they have filled in for me where I could not be there. So I just want to thank my leadership team for, for being the team that they are and for filling in and always having my back. So thank you. Thank you to them. Okay. So we'll move on to the executive team. Mr. Perluski. Yes, ma'am, Madam President. The only thing that I would like to add is that uh, during the entire month of February, as a matter of fact, today we finished our last site visit. Uh, Dr. Kane, myself, Ms. Pauls, and all of our curriculum supervisors have done our second uh, winter visit. If you recall, we did all of our uh, fall visits. Uh, I just want to thank all of our leaders of all of our schools, and especially our teachers that do a phenomenal job in our school system every day in improving instruction. Uh, we're doing a lot of phenomenal things. We still have work to do, uh, but it's, it's been a great opportunity for us to visit all of our schools and to see the wonderful things that are going on. So uh, I'd like to recognize all of our schools. Thank you. At this time, we're gonna move on to the student board members. Um, Sarah, last time. Grace, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, so this month at Kent Island High School, our spring musical, The Music Man, opened on March 1st and had performances on March 2nd and 3rd as well. There are upcoming performances on March 9th and 10th at 7 p.m. and a matinee at 2 p.m. on March 11th. Yesterday was the induction ceremony for the National Technical Honor Society, and we are also hosting the SAT on school grounds on March 10th. Prom Expo is on March 22nd, which will be a fun event to prepare for our prom on April 21st. And that's all. Thank you. So our production of Susan School the Musical has been a huge success. Thank you to everyone who came to support our cast and crew. We hope you can make it this Saturday at 7.30 or this Sunday at 3. Our freshman class is proud to present Soulfied Village featuring our own Devon Comages on March 17th. Doors open at 6 p.m. and the concert begins at 7 in the Queen Anne's County High School Auditorium. Okay, my laptop shut off. <laughs> As for our sports update, congratulations to Mackenzie Hemingway and Haley Ritter for becoming swimming state champions. Our women's basketball team won their regional championship game against Elkton this past Saturday and are headed to state championships this Friday night at 5 and hopefully again Saturday at 1. This is the first time our women's basketball team has ever gone this far, so congratulations and good luck, ladies. Spring sports kicked off on March 1st and are off to a great start. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sharon. All right, at this time, we're gonna to move towards community participation. We ask that the speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to two minutes, two minutes in length. Comments longer than two minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper avenue to address specific students or employee personnel matters. 
<coughs> especially those matters on a legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of an individual staff member are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizens' participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when <coughs> offering your critique. And the first person we have signed up tonight is Fred Christie. for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I, my name is Fred Christie. I'm the Ken Allen High School ice hockey coach, and I've been the ice hockey coach for 15 years. And um, in 2009, the uh, Ken Allen and Queen Anne's were split into two different teams, and the board recognized us and, and uh, basically integrated us into the, the school system, and we were allowed to do things such as um, we were in the yearbook, we were um, able to do things like uh, give varsity letters and pins. Uh, we had three buses to go to, to games. And we also, uh, the Booster Club was allowed to help us with our um, um, with uh, uh, scholarships and, and things along that line. And um, the athletic director and their staff were incredible. For the last nine years, they've helped us out. Nancy Parks, Dan Harding, Betty Lee, David Wagner, and John Marchetto really helped us get to where we are right now. But uh, my request is, uh, we have a couple issues. One is, we have some talented teacher coaches that cannot help us because they have financial issues at home. And some of the other, uh, some of the other um, athletic programs, they pay or have stipends for their, um, for their coaches. And one, one of our coaches in particular is, is, has to, can't help us coach because he has to do driver's ed to be able to make ends meet. <coughs> and um, the, the coaches that have helped us are Bill Hazy, TJ Callahan from Kent Island, and Chris Voris from, from Queen Anne's County. And we'd like to be able to get them, um, uh, to incent them to be able to help us just like the other sports. And then last but not least, um, we'd like to request more buses for our practices. We practice at uh, the Naval Academy at three o'clock in the afternoon and some of our students have to navigate the Bay Bridge. And I think it's, a, it, it's definitely a safety issue, and we would really like to have some support. You guys have supported us incredible. This is the first year that Ken Island made it to the semifinals of the states this year. And we asked for a bus to that game. We were provided a bus. We ended up losing in the semifinals, but it was a, a great experience for the kids. We had 35 players on our team, and five girls were a co-ed team. Oh, wow. And um, we actually were on Channel 2 News in Baltimore. They did a story on us. And so I'm, I'm very proud. And then eventually, I'd love for us to be a full varsity status. And I have paperwork that I can submit for my request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next sign up is Richard McNeil. Which one's on there, too? Good evening. Um, my name is Richard McNeil, and, you, and I've been here, I think, several meetings, so you're familiar that I'm president of the Retired Educators Group. Also, I'd like to recognize Dave Van Wick, who's a member, who's here with us tonight also. Um, one of the things that I'd like to uh, highlight uh, is the performing arts uh, teams at both high schools. Uh, I've been to both of the musicals, and it's been outstanding. And, uh, you know, I don't know how they do it. Uh, when you've got over 60 members up on the stage at Queen Anne's, and I don't know how many at Kent Island, but a lot, and uh, just, just had a wonderful, wonderful entertainment, and it's great to see the talent that those teachers have pulled together from the students and, and bring that out. If you haven't seen any of that, I encourage you. This is the last weekend for it. It's been great. Uh, also at Queen Anne's, I'd um, like to highlight uh, Stephanie Zeiler, uh, who has been uh, taking it upon herself to get some other folks. They're, they're painting quotes uh, in the bathrooms, and uh, that's starting to go around the school. If you have opportunity, I encourage you to go in and, and see those. I don't know whether, Mr. Polisky, whether you've seen any of those or, or said, doing a great job. It's uh, some of the community efforts. It's been a lot of her free time after school and on Saturdays, and uh, I think it's just going to be a nice way to walk in. It's not uplifting quotes per se, but it's quote from artists and musicians and mathematicians and scientists all the way around the building. 
So if you have an opportunity to do that. I'd like to also highlight, since we're just finishing up uh, Black History Month, just to remind everybody that the Hope School that's out on Queen Anne's County property, the one in the front, is and was uh, a Afro-American school in this county early on. Uh, we plan on uh, having that open the first Saturday of the month, starting in May, May through October. Uh, I was just contacted. We're going to have a couple schools, elementary schools, visited in June. So we're going to have it open for that. And again, if you've not been in that building, it's kind of unique to see the old-style desk and the potbelly stove and, and some of the textbooks that go back to the 1800s. Uh, so it's a good place to see that. One of the things that uh, we like to do, too, is, I don't know where she went, but welcome uh, and encourage Robin as she retires from this group to join our group, and I know she will be missed here. And my last comment would be um, thank you for all the work you've done on the budget, and as you go forward, I, I wish you well and uh, hope that things can be worked out between the commissioners, this community, and the school board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Karen Fields. Karen Fields. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. I would like to discuss some budget um, priorities, and what I am discussing is a matter of public record. As QA CEA continues to bargain in good faith, we urge that the final decision regarding the budget not be resolved until parties have had more time to negotiate. While the county has recovered from the recession, teachers and support staff have not. It is important to note that Queen Anne's County is competing with neighboring counties to recruit and retain staff. Surrounding counties are working to make structural changes to the ESP salary scale to begin to address the need for a living wage. 35% of QA support staff make below the living wage of $30,500 per year, and 20% of those employees make below the poverty wage of $24,000 per year. Teachers that lost a step in 2012 are still waiting to recover that step, which the board has continued to recognize as a need. The Board of Education will provide independent bus drivers with a 2.2% cost of living increase per their contract. The rise in the cost of living affects all board employees, and we hope that this is considered in the 2018-2019 budget. QA CEA looks forward to working with the Board of Education to advocate before the county commissioners for a budget allocation that meets the needs of teachers and ESP, providing the services that our students deserve. Queen Anne's County is able to attract families to live here, adding to its tax base because we have a school system with a reputation for high academic achievement. Whether we are classroom teachers, media specialists, custodians, maintenance workers, instructional assistants, bus drivers, school nurses, or secretaries, the day-to-day -day responsibility for achieving this success rests with us we urge that it is acknowledged in the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Tu. Good evening, board. Um, thank you for recognizing me tonight. Uh, basically, I hope I'm in the right place. Last night, uh, I attended a booster meeting at Queen Anne's County High School, high school for football. My son plays on the football team there. And through the meeting, we were discussing finances and, 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 and so forth. And it came up in the meeting that the ban uh, monopolizes the concessions at the high school. Um, so I think what I'm asking for tonight is, like, you guys to look into it, to find out if it's true. Uh, we're not allowed to sell any items as a football booster club that the band is all, that the band has a concessions. If we are able to find something like cotton candy that they're not selling, we have to set up on the outside of the uh, of the stadium, right on the on the outside. Um, it was also brought up that they do all sporting events at, in the stadium that happens at the stadium and they are in control of concessions. We're not asking to take concessions, we're asking for like some type of 
mediation between the two where not just football but other sports because we all need money um we're all under budget constraints right now and that was just spoken about we're just looking for some equity and it, sh it shouldn't be monopolized by one institution in the high school um we do a lot of fundraising so it's not like we're not uh being proactive in getting money for football i believe football is the most expensive sport in the in the school um we do fundraisers pretty much every month and oftentimes it's still not enough so we wouldn't ask the school board to give us more money, we would just ask for the opportunity and some equity to work that concession stand. Um, last night was my first meeting there, my son's only a freshman, but it was brought up that they have made efforts in the past to try to uh, work with the band, and it's pretty um, cut and dry. This is our building, we built the building, we bought the equipment, no. Um, so that just doesn't sit well with me, so I didn't know where to go. Um, I figured this would be a good place, a lot of smart women up there. Um, so. I'm just looking for some type of, yeah, I'm going to play that card. <laughs> I'm just looking for, uh, It's looking called for, sucking up, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you succeeded. I'll take it. Okay. I'm just looking for a point in the right, we're looking for a point in the right direction, um, a way to start to try to mediate that relationship. We don't want to bully anything. Um, I, we lo I love the arts. Hopefully my daughter will be in the band in a couple years um, at the high school when she gets there. Uh, but right now, I have a football player, so that's why I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. And our next speaker is already up front, yes, Deanna um, Gunther. Yes, my name is Deanna Gunther, and I have two boys uh, in the high school at the moment. They both play football and baseball. Um, I'm a part of the All Sports Boosters, the Football Boosters, and, um, and I've been a part of it for three years. I didn't know that they were separate um, entities, and so uh, the All Sports Boosters um, has a general fund, and then each sport has its own allotment. You know, what they raise gets put in its own account, and it's, you know, accounted for. Um, and the Football Boosters branched off, you know, joined them because they were their own entity um, years ago, but they joined with the all sports due to insurance uh, reasons, I believe, you know, coverage, that sort of thing. So, but we still hold uh, monthly meetings uh, the first Tuesday of every month because football is so expensive and, you know, the money that we just get from uh, the athletic director, um, you know, that part for the uh, refs and the equipment, that sort of thing, um, is just not enough because I don't know if anybody knows this, but those boys are fed before every single game. That's JV and varsity. They are given, um, and that's with the either the football boosters provides that or we have, to, as parents, we go around looking for food donations and we get a lot of help from the restaurants in the area. and. Um, so, and then we also provide Gatorade during the games, bottled water um, for the meals. We provide um, protein bars at um, halftime for the boys because we have a lot of players that play both ways. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things. There's equipment that, you know, the budget from the athletic director just does not pay for. You know, the pads are $300 a piece. We needed a new sled, which is a couple thousand dollars. You know, just for that, that's, you know, a lot of money. Um, and we have, I, we have uh, requested or, you know, asked, I've asked the All Sports Boosters and, um, you know, they have made mention to the band, uh, cassette, you know, the band, and they have, you know, blatantly said that, you know, they, built the building. Um, it's been like this for 22 years. They've purchased every piece of equipment in the building um, and that even if they do not man the concession stand during a game, um, it, it could be any game because I think they only do fall um, games. They do not do the lacrosse Ms. games. Gunther, I'm going to have to ask you to start <laughs> wrapping okay. it up because we have a long list tonight. So. Okay. Um, but we have requested to use the concession stand. They blatantly have said no. So we just would like a compromise, even if it's during lacrosse or we're allowed inside the gates to sell food because we can't, we are not. So, you know. We will look into it for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight but didn't sign up? Mr. Phil Dumanel? 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Dumanel. I'm here this evening representing the Kent Island High School Athletic Boosters. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate Kent Island hockey team for uh, competing in the semifinals in the state championship. I just want to um, just really <coughs> repeat what my fellow board members from the Boosters at Queen Anne's County High School is sharing with you. You take a look at some of these line items in the budget, and it's a difficult challenge. As a former commissioner here in Queen Anne's County, I understand the challenges of balancing a budget. But the line item for athletics at the high school, and both of them, is a little thin. Um, the cost for umpires, the cost for referees, the cost for equipment. The uniforms can't be purchased new until they've been used for four years. So there's a lot of challenges that our athletic directors face. And let's face it. Athletics plays a big part in a high school experience for our students. We boast that we have great kids, we have a great school system and great teachers, but athletics is a, an important part of that experience and the challenges that they face and they'll face when they grow up and enter the world and become citizens of their own. So please consider when you take a look at these budget that you consider looking at some of these line items regarding athletics and see what you can do to help them out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. State your name, please. Sean Jones. <clears throat> I'm the president of the Queen Anne's County High School Music Department Band, Band Boosters Association. And uh, first, I want to thank the board for having us. And I want to pay a special thank you to the media specialist here tonight that I've spoken to. And I want to offer an invitation for anybody with questions, whether they be parents or students or other boosters, to attend one of our open meetings. Our next one is April 5th at 7 p.m. in the band room. And we'll be glad to answer any questions regarding our fundraising efforts. Um, the comments that I heard this evening had me come to the podium up here because we were never approached about anything. And uh, I want to offer that, that we would be glad to set up a meeting and answer any of their questions. Thank you. Not take the board's time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were finished. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone else? That concludes our... Oh, come along. Come along. <laughs> come along. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, my name is Frank Rattel. I am the father of a um, Kent Island hockey player. And uh, to support Coach Christie, I wanted to just come up and say for a couple minutes about um, the timing of the practices at Navy is very difficult for a lot of parents to get their children to the rink. Uh, it's a 3 o'clock time that it starts right after school, and a lot of the students have a hard time getting rides. Hockey's in a, a sport where there's an awful lot of equipment involved, so even seniors that have licenses that can drive can only fit so many players into a car to go across the bridge and practice. Uh, the program's grown exponentially over the last couple of years. Uh, I think this year we were over 30 kids uh, that played both JV and varsity. And uh, it's very difficult for a lot of these players and families whose parents work to get their children to practices on time at the Naval Academy. So um, in support of Coach Christie's request for some additional busing uh, support, I just wanted to put my voice behind that. So thank you. Mr. Rattel, can you spell your name for me, please? It's R-A-T-E-L. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Not seeing anyone else interested in speaking at this time. Uh, this concludes our public comment time, and we'll move on with the meeting, Ms. DiMaggio. Thank you. At this time, we will move on to our presentations. Dr. King, would you like to introduce your first presentation of the evening? Yes, our first presentation is a monthly expenditure report, Ms. Landgraf. Okay, you should have um, the two monthly reports in front of you. Um, I don't think there's anything abnormal on the reports this time. Um, we've talked about the transportation or the special education uh, <coughs> overage in non-public placements. We've discussed that each month. And then the only other area at this time that we have some concern is in contracted services under maintenance. 
and we'll continue to keep an eye on them and hopefully we'll be able to transfer within the category to take care of that. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just looking. Um, so, so do we have to school safety? School safety. Oh, sure school, safety. school safety. School safety. So and anything, and, yeah, so I'll introduce school safety, but anything that needs a vote will come up under action items, so we're okay for now. Okay. So All right, okay. so, uh, yep, so our next presentation is going to be um, for school safety and security. So, Mr. Pender, if you please come forward, and I know that Sheriff Hoffman is here. Welcome. Police are here too. Um, but we have several uh, law enforcement officers with us. I see that we might have the conglomerate. We have state <laughs> troopers, Centerville Police Department. Do we have? And we have sheriff's office. So, thank you all for being here for this very important um, conversation about school safety. There they are. Some chairs. There they are. You need some chairs. Are you guys okay there, or do you want to come join us? Whatever All right, I didn't realize we were having a big party here. But. <laughs> so um, good evening, board members, superintendent. Um, I'm Sid Pinner, director of operations, and we have several uh, representatives um, from law enforcement here tonight to help discuss a uh, very serious topic within our school system, and that's the safety and security of, of all of our students, staff, and any visitors that come in there. And I, I want to start out by saying I don't know of many counties that I can personally pick up the phone and call the sheriff directly, uh, the Gary Hoffman, um, or the Barrett commander, or first sergeant at state police, uh, Mr. G uh, first Sergeant Gill, or uh, Chief Rhodes at Centerville PD. And I think that goes a long ways by the kind of community we have and the kind of uh, communication that we have amongst uh, the different groups. Um, <clears throat> and along with that, kind of the purpose tonight is, again, to ensure the safe and secure environment for all Queen Anne's County Public School students, staff, visitors, and to ensure the school system is prepared to efficiently respond to all emergencies that might affect the safety or security of students and staff. Um, basically, a few objectives. Um, we want to develop a standardized response to all hazards response plan in cooperation with local emergency responders. And I know we have law enforcement here tonight, but that also includes um, Department of Emergency Services. Uh, Chief Scott Haas works closely with us also. We want to assist the school administration in emergency crisis planning and building security matters. Reduce the risk and improve response to threats and hazards of all sorts. Um, ensure the Queen Anne's County Public Schools in compliance with uh, the uh, Maryland State Department of Education Emergency Preparedness Procedures, and um, Emergency Crisis Management Process. We want to prevent, prepare, response, and have a recovery. So basically, um, again, with the Sheriff, First Sergeant Gill, um, and, and Chief Rose sitting here, I want to kind of go over two parts to this. The first part is basically the physical part, the structure of the building. And I also, before I go a little further, I want to thank the County Commissioners, because a lot of this couldn't be done without um, the county commissioners give us, giving us the funding along with the, um, uh, the state. So thank you to them also. About five years ago, we had about five to six analog cameras per school. We had eight different uh, security camera systems. There was a DVR, basically the old VCR that was plugged in. Um, and you had to go into the technology closet, which was locked in the media center. Um, there was no process for identifying if the cameras were working. Um, no central monitor to view from the front office, and we had a very limited amount of access controls. Um, and when I say ac access controls, I'm talking about proximity card readers that you can have your badge um, and go up to get into the school. So where we are right now, we have about a ten or uh, sorry, five phases that we've completed. Um, what happened and became and I became aware of it. I went to Centerville Elementary School for somebody that had broke a window. Um, stole a purse out of a car. I go in to look at the cameras. None of the cameras worked. So I started looking around at all the schools. Um, like I said, we had eight different 
um, systems in place, which we could not manage at all. So um, we you know, did our bidding, came out, had a company called Skyline, a reputable company that does all of the MDOT cameras that you're looking at to see what the road conditions are. Um, we worked with them. The county also works with them. So we installed servers at each of our schools for, um, when that happened through the fiber optic uh, cables. We installed uh, digital IP cameras on all of the exterior of the buildings and the main entrances along with A phones. And A phone, when you go up to the school, you push the button, the secretary has the little uh, TV there. He or she can talk to you through the phone um, to see if you know, you're allowed to come in. Th they've been a great tool. We just had somebody try to enter a school the other day through um, the cafeteria entrance. And you know, sorry, if you wanna come around, come around to the front, you know, show your credentials. And you know, they actually left the building. Um, our third phase, we replaced all analog cameras with uh, digital IP cameras. And we also added um, 11 extra cameras, exterior cameras at Queen Anne's County High School. So if you're looking at this, now we have over 385 cameras throughout the building, our, our 14 buildings. Um, and again, that's just one phase that we're going through. Um, with those cameras, we can now, the principals can view them from their computer in their office. I can pull them up, I can tell you right now, um, this morning when it was snowing and we were trying to figure out what to do with school, I can look at every camera um, I have, I look at the parking lot, see what kind of conditions they are. So we use them for a lot of, of other reasons also. Um, they've been a great asset to us. On the fourth phase, uh, phase sorry, we installed additional interior cameras in the elementary school, um, hallways, gyms, cafeterias. and. We also installed blackout blinds um, that were fire marshal approved um, within the school. Now, with the interior cameras, what we've done, um, we still have a few more schools to go. That is kind of our next phase that we're overlapping there. Um, we've tried to put them in the gyms and cafeterias. It's cut down on um, he said she thing. He said she said things with like parks and basketball, um, theft, those kinds of things. Um, the fifth phase. We've converted our four proximity card systems into one. Um, this is a crucial phase here because what we realized after we did the reverse evacuation, not all teachers had access to the building um, with their keys. So with the proximity card, um, we now, they now have access to, um, to the doors. So we went from having about 22 card uh, controls to having about over 103 right now. So that's been a great, uh, feature for us. Where are we headed? Um, we are trying to make every school have a single point entry. When a parent walks into the building, they're going to have to go, you know, be buzzed in, go into the vestibule, and then be buzzed in again. We were just able to complete Churchill Elementary School and Sellersville Elementary School. We still have Queen Anne's County High School, Kent Island High School, Centerville Middle School, and Bayside Elementary School that we're look, looking at. As you can Imagine something like Ken Island High School is going to be really tough to try to have a solution for, but we're, we're working on that. Um, on this, the seventh phase, MView, it's live streaming a video to law enforcement. Um, I have a meeting this Friday with uh, MCAC, which is the Maryland Coordination Analysis Center. Um, I think the best description of that would be kind of like the state um, you know, Homeland Security Agency where all the information is gathered. They have some grants. Um, we're going to be looking at that, and this will allow law enforcement to be able to access our cameras in the middle of, you know, an emergency or a crisis, so they'll have live um, instant feedback on that. The eighth phase that we're gathering information on right now is replacing the exterior door, um, locking hardware, and also installing panic button um, for the secretaries or principal that they can actually do that from their uh, phone if they need to. Um, one of the things we've realized at our high schools over the past many years, keys have been get given out um, to coaches. Not all keys have been collected. Um, and I think for both high schools, that is a major uh, concern um, that a lot of people have, along with myself. Um, the ninth phase that we're also looking at, installing to-go bags in each classroom. Uh, Dr. Ciotola was generous enough to give us mass trauma kits to put at each um, of the uh, main entrance of each school by the AED machine. Uh, what we've looked at and studied recently is, hey, if an active assailant or shooter gets into the building, um, 
all we can really do is put layers in place to slow them down until law enforcement shows up. And, and I'll let them talk in a little bit, but law enforcement changed the way that they responded, you know, of, of not waiting for the SWAT team, but actually going in right then and there. So those um, mass trauma kits are great in the hallway, but our most injured uh, individuals are gonna be the students that are in the classroom, um, that we're gonna have time clearing each room to get to get to them. So having those in there, the to-go bags, basically be tourniquets, those types of things. Um, a young lady did a great job at Kennard Elementary School as a project, um, Maddie Br uh, Mackenzie Brown um, instituting that there. Great idea, and I really would like to go forward with that. And in the 10th phase is, is to standardize the interior um, door locking devices. As you know, we have an assortment of different controls and doors. And when an incident is occurring, to have the fine motor skills to stick that key in that door and turn it is going to be really tough, let alone you know, trying to barricade yourself in there. So we're looking at those um, objects. Now, where were we five years ago, basically? This is kind of the more, um, the training aspe aspect of it. We had a flip charts with multiple pages, uh, paper copies that really had no sequence. Um, we didn't have a, a national incident management system here at the school or an incident command system. That is what law enforcement and um, DES follow. We <coughs> instituted that. We had a color-coded system where we would say, okay, code red. Um, code blue, code green, and I actually did a drill at one of our schools and just made up colors. And they had a response for it, but there really was no color for that response. And so right now, we call it the way it is. I mean, if it's a lockdown, if it's an active shooter, keeping it plain language. Um, we had a lack of emergency preparedness planning for our administrators. Um, we had limited planning and communication with law enforcement and emergency services. And one of the great things our state has done is the Maryland Center for School Safety. And I'll explain and talk about that in just a second. Um, where are we now? We have the NIMS training for administration. We have the IC structure in place, common language. We have the top level plan that the board responds to. We have a site specific emergency preparedness plan. And we also have um, the site specific uh, flip charts in each classroom. Uh, those were took a lot of time to go through, but again, that's just the plan. That is just a piece of paper sitting there that is a resource. We need to roll that into the actual practice, um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. We have the Maryland Center for School Safety um, and Maryland Coordination uh, Analysis Center. Every Monday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, Sheriff Hoffman, one of his deputies, and sometimes Centerville PD and myself are on a conference call with every um, local jurisdiction, the uh, Board of Education, the state police, and they actually go over what's occurring in the state, what areas of concern, um, what are, what's trending uh, with social media, and also uh, when we're taking field trips to Washington, D.C., New York City, th those law enforcement agencies are also on there. We're required to report any um, field trip that is going to uh, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., or Baltimore so that they have the information of if an incident were to happen, they would send out a robocall, you know, alerting people to get back on the bus. It's a really good feature that uh, they've instituted. Where are we now? We have quarterly meetings with law enforcement, emergency services, and principals. Um, we actually had uh, Director Ed Clark, who um, is the exec executive director of the Maryland Center for School Administration, uh, I'm sorry, for school safety, do a tabletop exercise with us. Um, MSDE requires us to do all of our emergency preparedness drills, the reverse evacuation, evacuation, shelter in place, um, severe weather, and also uh, earthquake. We had Mr. George Roberts, who was the principal of Perry Hall High School. If you remember a few years ago, they had a shooting, I think it was the first day of school, <coughs> came and spoke to all of our administrators on what he observed and lessons he learned. Um, great speaker, very, very inspirational. We have had um, several people certified in ALICE. You might have heard Run, Hide, Fight. There's several different models. Uh, so it's alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. When I say there's several different models, we want to try to give all of our teachers, um, assistants, bus drivers, maintenance, any of the tools they can have. Um, in case an incident happened. So we're not 100% committed to Alice. We're looking for the right fit. 
Um, we, law enforcement, we're very fortunate to have the alert training, which is the advanced law enforcement rapid response training that was held at Queen Anne's County High School of how they're gonna enter the building uh, when something occurs. And then we also, like I said, we had the mass trauma kits installed. Communication's the key. Again, being able to pick up the phone. I, I just kinda wanna give you one quick scenario. Um, the Sheriff's Department you know, has um, a resource officer in each high school, one in the middle school that roves around, and another one that helps out with the elementary schools. And not only are they in the schools, but Sheriff Hoffman has his deputies, I call them patrol checks, you know, but they're coming into the school, walking around, even though they're not an SRO, becoming familiar with the building. Because if something is to occur or were to occur, we want the law enforcement to know what's the building, the layout of it is. Because having a map at that time, you're not gonna stop and look at the map. Uh, First Sergeant Gill, um, Lieutenant Rob Conley, They've also instituted those uh, patrol checks in Centerville PD. One quick little story here. Um, one of the state police uh, happened to walk through Ken Island High School, just kind of uh, interacting during lunch, happened to see a student um, sitting by himself, just kind of stuck, stood out, yeah, you know, saw the child. Um, that state trooper was uh, then sent to a call a couple of days later, remembered seeing that student, had that communication, that kind of uh, bond, and was able to help that student um, just by being able, you know, in the school, recognizing him, kind of having that language of, you know, communication and not looking at law enforcement like, oh, I mean, okay, something bad's going to happen. I mean, having those positive um, relationships. Social media um, has been a huge uh, issue and since the uh, shooting in, in Florida. Um, you know, sometimes People might not make the best choices and put something on there um, that might involve, you know, I'm going to harm some students at a school, um, you know, talking about guns. We take those very seriously. Um, I've been in close contact with law enforcement here, and we've worked with the principals. Law enforcement has gone out to the um, individuals' homes to check on their welfare to see if there are any weapons available. Um, and again, not many counties have that ability to work that closely. And then the last aspect is, is mental health. Um, Brad uh, Engel is working closely to do some uh, uh, professional development uh, at ANS next week. That's a huge piece that we really need to kind of focus on. Um, where are we headed now? We've learned a lot and we got a long ways to go. I mean, this isn't something where it's a fire drill and you go out the same exit every time. You look at Florida, the young man pulled the fire alarm. You know, students were exiting. Now you start questioning yourself, all right, when you pull the fire alarm, do we run out the door automatically? Do we wait? Uh, Baltimore- Can I ask a question yeah. on that? Or do we have um, fire alarms outside of our school or only on the inside of our school? It's a mixture. Some of them have them depending on when they were built. Okay. Um, and that, that is something we also looked at. It's a good okay. point. Um, what we've learned out of this is, hey, we've got a whole population that we're not hitting. And when I say that, we have the training at the beginning of the year for Alice, the Sheriff's Department and everybody comes around, it's great. You know, we do some um, practical training on that. But what about the people that we hire mid-year? What about the custodians? What about the maintenance? What about the bus drivers? I mean, there's a whole population and even the substitutes that they're in the school and all of a sudden, hey, we've kind of missed that. Um, really, what we want to look at is an online virtual um, educator response so that when the school starts up, everybody can go on, take that. Um, also, one is age appropriate for the students. And then do the practical hands-on for everyone Sorry. to incorporate that. But like I said, we've learned that we've, we've missed the population that we really need to hit. Um, and also online training for Stop the Bleeding. Another area that we really need to improve on is our reunification process. And I'm in the middle right now of meeting with principals. The reunification process is, hey, after the incident is over, how do we get those students back to their parents and how do we make sure everybody's accounted for? Um, the uh, EMS helicopter staging areas. And the last part that we really need to hit um, the sheriff uh, had a few deputies attend last week uh, down at Bennett High School. What about our after-school activities? 
uh, football games, basketball games, PFY. You know, and, and a, a principal made a good comment down there, and, and one of the deputies might have told you, but he said, hey, our schools where he taught, they're like Fort Knox. He goes, but all of a sudden when three o'clock rolls around, the bell goes, all the doors go open, and everybody just flows through. And I mean, that's an area that we really got to concentrate on and, and, and do a lot of, lot of work on. Um, I don't want to take up any more time, but I, you know, for the sheriff, uh, first sergeant or chief, you'd like to say a few words? Briefly, um, I want to thank you, Sid. That was a very good recap of kind of everything that we've done. First of all, I want to thank the board, um, superintendent as well, for all that you guys have done in your partnership. I'm glad tonight we're sitting here on the edge of prevention and not the edge of tragedy. You know, so I want to thank all of the partners that are here, and they're, and they're very well represented in law enforcement because without them, this isn't about one person, this is about all of us, a community, a school, parents, teachers, students as well, making our school safe. The one thing that I think is the key component that's really important for the community is not to be afraid to report and not to be afraid to say what they see on social media. Um, a lot of times when you look at the incidents that have occurred across our country, um, there are indicators that are out there that both students and parents have seen and I think it's important that the community be aware that please bring that information forward to us so that any one of these three law enforcement agencies can act appropriately and swiftly uh, to at least intervene in what's going on in that home or with that student so we can determine. Um, we have great communication with the allied agencies and our school resource officers um, and great partnerships with them in the community as well as the students that attend the schools. Um, our training, we have a no delayed response training approach and we all know that if we have an active incident or a critical incident in the school that we are going in to engage, sadly, that person that is creating a tragedy uh, within our community. So we are not going to delay any response in going in there. Uh, with that being said, um, it wouldn't be possible though without the help of Sid Pender. You recapped everything very well uh, in what you stated. Um, you know, funding is going to be an interesting issue. I know that we know on the state level as well, there's been discussion of funding that could come down the pike for law enforcement as well as to our schools. I think that's an important thing that we need to immediately jump on and look at to see how we're going to fund and whether we as a community want to go forward with adding additional, you know, deputies to different schools and to at what level. Uh, currently, we're supplementing that with <coughs> patrol checks from the command staff, allied agencies as well, all the way down to the deputies that work in those schools. But I think we have a lot of discussion that needs to come forward in our partnerships to figure out where we want to go with this funding and what needs to be done to better serve the student population and protect them as well. Um, we always have room to adapt and change. Uh, this is a very fluid situation. And I think that us always staying on this and the, the strides that the school board has made uh, with looking over your presentation uh, are to be commended. And uh, I think we are one of the leaders within Maryland and I know that we're doing the right thing and we're always preventative and we're always out there. And thank you. Thanks, sir. Chair Paul, can I ask, well, make a statement and ask a question. The first is, um, are air resource officers, do they have um, loaded guns? Do they have guns? Do Absolutely. they carry guns? Absolutely, they do. Okay. That's, a, that's been a big question. Sure, and, and we will never, I, okay. I, as long as I'm your sheriff, we will never okay. go away. Because we hear school systems that don't. Yeah. They're just a resource officer there, that, but they have no gun. Um, and the second, I'd like to make a statement, is that um, you sent me your, the um, video. Yes, ma'am. That you, if you could tell the audience as to where they can find that video, because that was really, really eye-opening. On the Queen Anne's County Office of the Sheriff page, there's a video that we put out talking to the community and parents about prevention. And it's everyone's responsibility to report things, to see, if you see something, say something. You know, and, and we are going to go out, uh, like Sid said, if it's eight o'clock at night uh, to investigate an incident. We want to stop that incident. It will not spill over till tomorrow. Our staff is right on it. Uh, the allied agencies are as well. I mean, it, it, I don't want to speak for them, but we're all, I think, on the same page with, they all address the incidents very swiftly and promptly. <coughs> In the side of prevention so the video is a great thing for parents to know that we are doing that as well as this presentation tonight I mean, well, it was awesome thank you thank can you can i ask a question is there anything that we provide our students um with like such a video of that that our students actually get to see so that they know they as well should be aware of what to see and or you know if they see something they should say something have we provided anything for them and school 
so much. so we've met with all of our administ our principals and they certainly are expressing that and, and making sure that the students get that message so if you see something say something we checked with them when we met with them last week we've also added sheriff's uh, video to our school district uh, Facebook page our social media um, so we have posted it wherever we could post it to ensure that the message gets out Okay. On the, uh, I have a question, a couple, few questions. On the student um, notification, one of the parents was talking to me that it's real easy to, in a back, because we're a friendly community, a student, someone is trying to get in the back door and the student goes, oh, wait a minute, I'll open it for you. Is, is there um, some training going on for the students? That was that, my question. And that is something we have discussed with the principals because every now and then, um, law enforcement and even the supervisors in uh, Mr. Paluski's uh, area go out and start pulling on the doors and seeing if they can gain entrance to it. Um, you know, it, it's so far we've had a, uh, a really good response with it. But again, you know, people become complacent and, you know, we have to just keep reminding them to, you know, always be on edge about that and always be aware of the surroundings and what's going on in your buildings. Okay, um, Sheriff, are you in your budget for the county? Are you asking for any more SROs, or have we identified a need for more? I'm not wild about a rotating one with the um, sure. middle uh, schools. I am currently in discussion uh, with that. I am actually uh, aggressively exploring where our options are going to be with funding through the state as well as what the county can provide, but that's currently in our discussions right now with the county commissioners. Governor and Hogan I, came out last week with 125 new million money, right. for cameras, you know, structural things, and also another 50 million in grants mm -hmm. that you know could potentially be used for SROs. But they're they have not released right. what the um, percentages are going to be, or is there a cost share, or any kind of thing like that yet? But we are looking at that. Yes. Okay. I have another question. Um, lessons learned. I'm wondering, is there a you know, there's a lot of things that happened around the country, and we see them piece by piece. Is there a central gathering of lessons learned, like at the FBI, or is there anything like that available that we could? Good, great question. The uh, Maryland Center for School Safety and MCAC, um, that is our gathering point, and we're very fortunate to have that. Uh, matter of fact, they have a, it just came out today, a meeting next week to, to go over those particular things. But they have training. Um, each year, um, it's, the state superintendent is on a conference call with us, not every week, but most of the time. But that is where we gain a lot of our uh, lessons learned, you know, and just sharing those. I mean, I, I, real quick, a great lesson from John Trenton, guys, the principal of Kennelan High School. He's like, hey, we do the training of lockdown, but guess what? The students are in first period, they may be in the gym. Second period, they may be on the second floor, and they actually go through that process in every class to become familiar with that, which, you know, I thought was a great idea. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're constantly learning, you know, what's going on. Baltimore County had the young man that they went into lockdown. The teacher said, hey, come on, get in the classroom. He was the individual that had the, the firearm. Um, you know, it, it's a whole gamut, and all we can try to do is give the best tools possible. we still got a long ways to go. I mean, we have doing a great job, but we got a, we got a ways to go. Um, I know you're headed to a reunification process. <coughs> I mean, I'm a parent of a high schooler, and I have no idea what to do, if, if how to get him. So is there, is that done at each school? I haven't checked with the school, but. Good. That's another, that's a good question. That's what, we have a primary and secondary relocation um, sites at each, each school does. But what I'm meeting with the principals now is discussing, hey, we're not going to be able to fit, you know, 50 police cars up there and, you know, 30 ambulances up there at that location. So where is it going to be after we clear a room? Are, you know, are we putting those students on a bus and transporting them to a larger facility that has the amount of parking? I mean, you're talking about Kennelan High School, you know, 1,200 kids. Can you imagine how many parents are coming to there along with law enforcement? I mean, that's that's a whole other area that we're, we're working on right now. It's... it's yeah. It's going to take time. Right. I mean, We're looking at where appropriate staging areas are for those schools. So outside of that school area, so we can get all the parents and the students reunited very quickly outside of that area. Because a lot of times what happens in a lot of these critical incidents is that you end up with parents, students, and then you also end up with police cars, ambulances, fire trucks, and you end up with this large parking lot. Uh, where we can't get the emergency resources in. So we're looking to look outside of that zone as to where great unification. I know Dr. Kane and I have personally spoken 
uh, okay. are making progress with this. So. Thank you. Um, Jen George, I'm going to put her on the spot here. She just <coughs> made a, a comment that is uh, very, very true. It's, it's very sad that we're sitting here talking about this. You know, it, 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 it's just beyond sad to think that this could happen in our school system. And um, we just have to be on top of it. And Mr. Pender, you can do everything you can do. And it seems like these kids, these shooters, they find themselves a way around what we have set in as a process. So that's all we can do. As I said earlier, all we can put in is levels to slow the progress yep. down um, yep. until law enforcement arrives. Did you want to say anything for Sergeant? Uh, do, I'm with the state police, obviously, and we recognize that we weren't um, as familiar with the school system inside the schools as we wanted to be. Um, we have a vested interest in the community. Um, I have family that's in the school um, system. So we have actually increased our patrols. You'll see us more. Um, our guys are actually supposed to be getting into the schools, getting familiar with the schools. Um, the Sheriff Department and, and um, Chief Roach, they, they do a great job with knowing that. We, we recognize that it was a weakness with us. So you will see a lot more state police presence. Please don't get upset that we're, <laughs> we're there and that there's a problem going on. We're just trying to familiarize ourselves with the school system. Um, I can honestly say someone mentioned a school, um, Centerville Elementary, a room number, and it just happened to be somebody that I'm familiar with. I had no idea what room number it was. So we recognize that, and we're stepping up the patrols, and you'll see us a lot more, um, just to, so we're for, so we're ready and prepared to help when it happens, if it happens. Chief, thank you all for having the opportunity to be here tonight and to discuss this very important topic. I'd like to thank Sid um, as well. Um, we've got a very well coordinated effort here amongst the three law enforcement agencies that you have set before you, and uh, I can honestly say that. Um, you know, we're always going to prepare for the worst and pray for the best. But uh, all these guys here, all the agencies involved are very well trained and they're very well equipped to handle these situations as unfortunate as, it, as they may be. Um, to echo what the sheriff had said, and, and I know people <coughs> probably get tired of hearing it, but we stress that if you see something, say something. We want to prevent problems before we have problems. And I think, um, as also as Sid has said, our training is not static. It's constantly changing. I mean, it's, and I'm sure it's been mentioned and most of you are aware, things, the training regimen, if you will, has changed very much since Columbine. I mean, the, the training and the response um, techniques have changed and they're going to continue to change. And we're going to get better at it as we go along. But like you also said, it's unfortunate that we have to sit here and, and discuss these issues. And I am a product of the Queen Anne's County School System. And uh, I would have never thought it would happen here. But if you in, in, um, interview the folks um, in Columbine and elsewhere, <coughs> they never thought it was going to happen there either. So we have to constantly train and be vigilant. And again, I can't stress it enough. If you see something, say something. And if it's in the town of Centerville, obviously we're going to take a look at it. But when we get a call like that, and we've had several, we've always shared that information instantly with the sheriff's office, whose responsibility through their SROs, they do a great job as, with the school system and the state police. You can't do it alone. So thank you much. Uh, if you need anything from Centerville PD, we have five schools in the corporate limits of the town, two elementaries the um, high school, the middle school, and Anchor Points Academy behind this building that we respond to. Primarily, uh, however, though, the Sheriff's Office handles uh, um, most of the calls out at the uh, high school and the middle school, but we're there to assist them. Um, my officers can pretty much get anywhere in, in the town within four minutes if they have to respond. We also we also have two instructors at the barrack that I'm aware of, probably more, that are civilian response active shooter um, instructors. So if the principals or administrators or teachers want us, you know, we could certainly help with that too. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you to all of your agencies and all of your officers, troopers, and deputies. So thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to say thank, thank you. you too. You know, um, I'm hoping that a lot of parents will watch this and um, 
put an ease to their to their mind, um, knowing that air schools are safe and secure. Um, because for the last couple of weeks, some parents have not felt safe and secure sending their children. And um, so, thank you all. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pender. So our next item is uh, the FY19 budget. And I'll go forward to get set up for that. <coughs> Guess he's got it. Mm -hmm. At the end. Okay. Um, should we ask the other? Take a break. Take a break. Take a break. Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to uh, take a 10 minute break to um, talk about something. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Kane. <laughs> We would like to uh, speak to cancel. Okay. So. Dr. Kane, you are up. All right. Well, thank you very much and good evening, uh, Madam President DiMaggio and fellow board members. For the record, I am Andrea Kane, Superintendent of Schools, um, and I am here to present tonight the superintendent's budget request. So, um, and Mr. Paluski is going to be my able assistant, and at the end, I'm going to ask for my exec team to come forward to respond to any questions that are posed. So, the purpose of today's presentation is to give the board and the public some background information on revenue and expense patterns over a period of time, funding from the county and the state, maintenance of effort, and per pupil spending. Uh, then we'll talk about the projected costs for fiscal year 2019. Um, as you can see before you, I just wanted to outline a couple of points that uh, represent our budget process. So as you know, this past fall, we administered a budget survey to our community and we heard loud and clear from several, uh, several respondents. We have tried to um, anticipate some of those uh, requests and throughout the budget process and uh, we'll talk about uh, those a little bit later. Um, December through current right now, we are meeting with our bargaining unit, so I would like to say um, which collaborates uh, Ms. Field's comments earlier today during public comment that we are not finished with negotiations. You will see some estimates um, in this budget request which really are placeholders representing requests that have been made from the bargaining units. Uh, January we analyzed and shared results of that budget survey. January and February we held meetings with schools and um, departments of central office regarding their budget requests. January and February we worked on uh, um, the budget or we had budget work sessions through uh, with our school board members. <coughs> March 7th we um, are presenting tonight the superintendent's budget request and we have uh, March 13 a draft budget will be submitted to our commissioners. The budget overview, just some broad overview points. The Queen Anne's County Public Schools FY18 operating budget is $96.7 million, which is an increase of $1.8 million or 1.9% over the fiscal year 17 budget. Our local contribution was um, no more than the minimum level required by maintenance of effort. In FY18, Queen Anne County Public Schools received $374,712 or 1.1% of additional state aid, uh, while grant funding from the federal government decreased by about $564,000 from, from the prior year. Grants and other restricted funds total $6.6 million for FY18 operating budget, a gain of $96.7 million. 
So I'm going to provide a little bit of background. As I stated before, this presentation is not only for, um, for you, uh, board members, but it is also for our, our listening public in an effort to keep everyone informed and, and be absolutely transparent about this budget process. So what we're looking at right now is a graphical representation of the county's fiscal year 18, um, the current year's revenue budget. As you can see, a majority of their revenue is generated through property taxes. That's almost 50 percent, followed by income tax revenue, which is about 37 percent. This graphical representation of how the county allocated their budget for the is um, for how the county budgeted for the current fiscal year. As you can see, the Board of Education receives about 41 and a half percent of the county's budget. The next largest slice goes to public safety, uh, followed by debt service and then public works. The uh, general government, as you can see, is about 7.46 percent, and the allocation to the school board um, is the lowest percent of county county budget, I have to say, that has been received. We'll show a little bit uh, more trend data regarding that. This slide is similar to the last slide, but it shows how the county's budget was spent 10 years ago. So this is for fiscal year 2008. At that time, um, the Board of Education received 46.77%. Now this one is for 2003 and it goes back 15 years just to show some trends of how the Board of Education's um, portion of the county budget was indeed at that point 50.59 percent and as you can see <coughs> the portion of the county's budget allocated to the school board um, has continued to decrease over time. So. Uh, there are some other areas that have um, shown a little bit of fluctuation. Um, public safety and public works were increased, both of those, by about 3.5%. Um, the school system decreased by about 9%, just over 9% over the last 15 years. The um, allocation of, as a percent of the county's actual um, expenditures. This slide shows the decline over the past 20 years. As you can see, 1997-98, um, the school system received almost 54% of the county's budget. Now, that was a long time ago, and, and finances were different, I have to say. Um, but in 2017-18, we received just over 41%, as I mentioned, and that's a reduction um, over the last 20 years of about 12%. This table supports the figures that you saw in the previous graph. As we start at the bottom, fiscal year uh, 98, the school board received 22.6 million of the, counters, of the county's 42.2 general fund expenditures, or 53.5% approximately of the budget. Um, in fiscal year 2018, moving up, the school board is slated to receive about $55.5 million of the county's $133.8 million budget, which is um, about 41.48%, as I mentioned before. This slide shows what Queen Anne's County Public Schools holds in fund balance. I thought it was important to uh, show what we hold in fund balance, and it represents the end of fiscal years 2014 <coughs> through 2017. Fund balance is a term, of course, that we use in accounting to report the difference between revenues and expenditures over time. These are the only funds available for emergencies, a contingency, or one-time cost. There are two lines that make up our fund balance, just to explain this graph a little bit more, the assigned and the unassigned. The assigned fund balance are funds that we hold in reserve to cover costs such as annual leave accrued but not yet paid, encumbrances from purchase orders outstanding at the end of the year, and future insurance costs. The the unassigned balance are the funds that we have to cover any unexpected costs or budget overruns. As you can see from this table, our overall fund balance averages about 3%, but our unassigned fund balance is usually less than 1% of our total budget. Each fund balance is made up of several items. Ours is unassigned and assigned, and the county has assigned, unassigned, and rainy day. These pieces make up the total, and the amount that's assigned to, for us is leave accrued but not paid, insurance reserves and encumbrances, as I mentioned just a moment ago. 
this information, I want to say, was taken from the Department of Legislative Services overview of Maryland local governments, and it shows the same information from the for the county government's fund balance. Their total fund balance runs between 15.3 and 19 percent, just about, and increases each year since uh, between 2014 and 2017. While the undersigned fund balance runs between six and seven percent, um, there is also a rainy day fund which trends right around seven percent. Um, and this shows a, a little bit of a significant increase between 16 and 17, from 7 percent to just over 11 percent. So let's talk about operating fund and uh, revenue and expenditures for the school system. The graph that you're looking at right now shows where our operating fund revenue comes from. As you can see, we rely on funds from the county for over 57% of our operating revenue. The state contributes about 35% of our restricted funds, um, and we make up about 7%. And the remaining percent comes from miscellaneous uh, sources such as building use and interest income, the retiree drug subsidy program, et cetera. This table shows the actual dollar amounts for our operating fund revenues for 2017 and 2018. I wanted you to see a little bit of a comparison and what the difference is for the two years. Unrestricted county funds represent maintenance of effort. In 2018, maintenance of effort, as this, graph sh as this table shows, was roughly $55.5 million, which represents an increase of $1.3 million or 2.41% beyond the 54 million from the previous year. This increase represents the required amount that was to be allocated due to increased enrollment, and we'll talk more about MOE shortly. The state allocation is based upon the formula for state aid broken down in our budget by foundation program, um, and transportation grant is included in there based on the number of students transported from school, uh, state compensatory aid, uh, which is for students that qualify for free and reduced meals, uh, limited English proficient students based on our number of students that don't have English as a, um, a primary language. Um, special education is based on the number of students that qualify for special education um, services. All of that is part of the state allocation. Uh, restricted funds, uh, they come to us from grants designated for a specific purpose. The majority of our federal funds are for special education and for Title I. We also have some other funds, as you see on the table, that are also restricted funds, but those funds are used to support the Family Center and majority of the Partnering for Youth grant. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about maintenance of effort. I have a quick little video here, and I hope that we can put that microphone up to the speaker so that we can um, get some sound. Can we, is that one working? Okay, let's, all right, let's. This video is a, a good example of the explanation of maintenance of effort, and I actually think because there are graphics to it, it can do a better job than I can than to explain maintenance of effort in layman's terms. So let's take a quick look. The one Me, the MOE. Hi there, I'm MOE. MOE stands for Maintenance of Effort. The state of Maryland law signed in 1984. It requires local governments to provide, at a minimum, the same level of education funding per student from year to year. MOE sounds like a solid plan to protect da, education da, da, da. funding, right? Well, not exactly. Maintenance of effort is a misnomer. MOE only maintains the same level of educational services if costs remain the same, and costs rarely stay the same. Prices just keep creeping up. We all experience this with our own personal finances and monthly bills. So while the MOE law provides for funding at the same amount per student from year to year, it does not account for the rising costs of educating students. MOE does not address inflation, wage increases, and the rising price of goods and services, such as fuel, electricity, health benefits, textbooks, computers, and other school materials. So with costs rising every year, funding at the maintenance of effort level actually means reducing our level of support for our students. I didn't know that. Well, it's true. 
Let's say we have a school system with 2,500 students with local funding per student at $10,000. This school system receives $25 million from its local government. Assume the next year that enrollment stays the same. If funded at the maintenance of effort level, the school system would receive $25 million again. But assuming an average cost increase of 2%, the school system would need $25.5 million to provide exactly, but no more, than what they are currently providing to students. So, they are half a million dollars short. By strictly using the MOE equation, this school system would need to make budget cuts. The same per student funding actually equates to less goods and services. And this equation does not account for the need for new programs, initiatives, or new strategies. When enrollment increases, the MOE law does provide for additional money per student as provided in the prior year. But it does not fund the additional money needed for the rising cost of educating all its students. This budget shortage could lead to larger class sizes, reduced services, and less student programs. While maintenance of effort gives us the floor, or the minimum, for education funding, it should not be considered the funding ceiling. We must factor in rising costs and the growing needs of our students so that our children receive the education they deserve. Okay. So maintenance of effort, uh, in a word, is uh, a funding level that we know is imposed on the counties by state law. The law requires county governments to provide as much funding as they did in the prior year on a per pupil basis. So for example, and I'll just give another quick example, if we had 1,000 students and the county funded uh, $7 million, then that would equal 7,000 per student. In the next fiscal year, if we had 1,001 students, they would be required to fund an additional 7,000 or seven million seven thousand dollars but of course you know things are not that simple we realize that in uh, 2012 the state law changed um, the county is now also required to meet an additional condition called education effort the education effort is calculated by dividing the appropriation given to the school system by the county's wealth expressing that as a percent the state then compares this percent to the five-year count statewide average percent for all counties and determines if we meet or exceed the average if we do not meet this test then the county is mandated to increase the MOE by the lesser of three amounts, the percent increase in the total wealth, wealth per pupil, the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil, or 2.5%. In fiscal year 18, Queen Anne's County, along with 12 other counties, did not meet the education effort criteria. Therefore, an additional amount of MOE will be imposed for fiscal year 19. When evaluating the three factors, those three bullets that you see before you and that were on the previous slide, it was determined that the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil was the least of the increase at 1.5%. So this was applied to the required per pupil allocation. I wanna note that education effort is MOE. There is no other interpretation. Education effort is MOE. It's required by state law and it is not an additional amount allocated over MOE. It is MOE. Here's the calculation for MOE for fiscal year 2019. We start with the prior year's highest allocation, so that would be fiscal year 18 allocation, which is 55.5 million approximately. This figure is divided by the prior year's September 30th enrollment to determine what the FY18 appropriation per pupil would be. Since the education effort was not met, that per pupil appropriation is increased by 1.5%. This gives us the adjusted per pupil amount, which then gets multiplied by the current enrollment to determine what the new MOE figure is for FY19. The difference between the current allocation and the future is the increase in MOE. Those are the additional funds that must be allocated to Queen Anne's County Public Schools for fiscal year 19. And you can see line F there represents the additional um, increase for us, which is about 1.3, um, almost 1.4 million. And that's due to an increase in enrollment. 
So over the past 15 years, the county um, has generally exceeded MOE um, in their allocation to the school system. There were only three times in the past 15 years that the county funded the district at or below MOE. And this graph represents the percentage over or under MOE that's been allocated to the school system. So the yellow line in the middle, point zero, represents the required MOE. The red line shows the percentage above or below MOE, which has been funded by the county. As you can see, for fiscal year 12, um, in the, the only in that year was the district funded below MOE. In fiscal year 11, and again in fiscal year 18, we were funded at MOE, level with MOE. And while it's difficult to see on this graph, the fiscal year 13, it looks like it's right on that line, but really it is funded slightly above, and I think it was something like 0.25% above MOE. And that is um, reflected in um, the next table. So this table shows the actual dollar amount that, were, uh, that I talked about in the previous graph. The figures in red represent um, the years in which the county allocated funds at or below MOE. And you can see FY12 um, is there and at MOE for 11 and 18. In January 2018, the um, MSDE released the preliminary state aid calculations, and based on their calculations, we will receive an additional $329,000 some odd dollars, as you see um, on this table, for fiscal year 18, um, 19. So some uh, project projected increases in the funding that we anticipate. I want to be certain, certain to share this with you in the public um, so that you can understand how we project those increases. And we're looking at um, required increase in MOE for FY19, and that's that $1,389,120, as I mentioned in the previous slide. The projected additional state aid, as I just mentioned, for $329,338. And the category of other funding is represented here. It has to be reduced by 264413 because that's the amount that was deducted from fund balance in FY17 to balance the budget for FY18. So once that amount is removed, the total estimated increase in funding for FY19 is $1,454,045. So we'll move on and we'll look at our expenditures. According to state law and the MSDE financial reporting manual, we are required to submit our budget to the state with the expenses distributed in the above categories. This is, um, as you can see, the majority of our budget is allocated to instruction, as it should be. The second largest allocation is employee benefits. Our total operating budget is $96,780,105. This pie chart shows how our operating budget is allocated in percentages. Of course, this chart reveals that 77% of our budget is in instruction and special education. It also includes transportation and associated employee benefits. That represents about 77% of our budget um, focused on our students and our employees. Um, please note that the administration portion, it's that small sliver of green up at the top, is 2%. And while I am new to the district, I sometimes hear uh, comments, um, and I want to dispel the notion that we have a bloated central office at 2%. That certainly is not bloated. Mid-level represents principals and assistant principals, and that's just over 5%. You can see instruction at 40, just over 40, um, and the rest spell out special education, student support, employee benefits, transportation, um, and that, that rounds us to just over 77%. Also, according to the uh, Maryland State Department of Education Financial Reporting Manual, each of those categories must be allocated to the following subcategories, or objects, as MSDE refers to them. Salaries and benefits account for over 80% of our budget. And I want to just be sure to explain a couple of the other items there. So certainly salary and benefits you see, but those contracts for $6.9 about $5.2 of that 
is represented by our bus contracts, and um, the majority of the remainder is in special education related services. About 3.3 million in other, you see those other charges there. About 2.7 million is utilities and graduation expenses, mileage, athletics, um, all are part of that category. So I wanted to make sure that you understood what was in those categories. This graph simply depicts the previous slide showing the portion that each allocation by object represents out of our total budget. So as I mentioned, salaries and benefits account for about 80%. The third largest portion is in contracted services. So we have to talk about how much does it cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County? Well, this table breaks it out for us. This data was obtained from the most current MSDE fact book, which was issued in 2014. And at that time, the cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County was $11,935. As you can see on this graph, a majority of that cost is in instruction. The second highest cost is fixed charges, which are employee benefits. And those two items account for about 70% of the total cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County. I want to note that that 2% for administration equals about $239 per pupil, and the mid-level for principals and assistant principals represents about 5% and about $597 per pupil. So together, that's about 7% of our pu per pupil allocation. And, and just as a side note, uh, of those $11,900, uh, about $6,400 or 54% come from local funds. And the state funds approximately $5,000 or 42%, and federal grants fund the remaining $500 at about 5%. This graph, um, the yellow line represents the state's average cost per pupil, the state's average cost per pupil. The red line represents Queen Anne's County's cost per pupil. And as you can see over time, our cost per pupil is drifting further and further below the state average, where back in 1993 and 94, the, um, Queen Anne's County spent about 97% of the state average. Uh, by 2014, we're spending about 87% of the state average. So by now, the point is the public and you have some facts. At this point, the question then becomes, are Queen Anne's County public school students being afforded educational opportunities that are at least average, right, in comparison to other state students across the state? The yellow line on this graph shows where the county ranks as far as wealth per pupil. In 1996-97, the county was the eighth wealthiest county in the state on a per pupil basis. From 2006 to 2011, Queen Anne's County was the sixth wealthiest county in the state. And the latest data on this chart shows Queen Anne's County as the seventh wealthiest. Now, ironically, during that same period, we slipped from 11th in the state and what we were able to spend uh, per pupil um, to 24th. Queen Anne's County spent the least amount per pupil in the state in 2011-12, 2012-13, and 2013-14. This data is the last information published by Maryland State Department of Education in the fact book. So we've reviewed our data from the Department of Legislative Services that indicates why, while Queen Anne's County continues to be the seventh wealthiest county on a per pupil basis, we fluctuated over the past several years from 20th in the state to the current rank of 22nd on per pupil spending. So let's move forward and take a look at our budget requests. Again, I'm gonna <coughs> somehow yeah, okay, good, we're, we're okay. So again, I'm gonna state that we are not finished with negotiations. I wanted to include these slides as placeholders so that you could have some understanding of estimate cost, estimated costs for negotiated contracts. So a, uh, a step increase would amount to about $1.3 million. 1% COLA would be about $625,000. And the cost for a loss step would be uh, just over about nine hundred fifty dollars or $947,147. 2.2 
uh, percent would be um, would equal three hundred thirty five thousand five hundred eighty one dollars, and that would be the cost to uh, fund a two point two percent increase for employees who are not eligible for a step increase because pretty much they're at the top of the scale. You see information regarding the cost for health care premiums. Active employees is about $705,000. Uh, retiree insurance is about $150,000. And that is refer representative of a projected increase of premiums at about 4.5%. We have requested some staff, uh, just so that you are aware. When we met with staff as part of our budget process, we uh, got about a request for about 35 positions. Um, over the course of time and, and after crunching and crunching and crunching and, and really taking a close look at our resources and how effectively we're using our resources, we were able to narrow that list down and to what you see before you. So we're asking for a total of eight new positions for fiscal year 19. The, um, and that um, represents about $700 thousand dollars. So one assistant principal for Ken Island High School. Currently Ken Island High School has one principal and two assistants, one of which is assigned to the annex, leaving only one assistant to handle the main building along with the responsibilities of athletic director. We're requesting four classroom teachers, one at Kent Island Elementary School um, for second grade, one math teacher for Centerville Middle School, and two teachers at Queen Anne's County High School, one for um, English Language Arts and Social Studies, so 0.5.5, and then one 1 1.0 uh, computer science teacher. So we will continue to evaluate class sizes and um, the current use of our resources to ensure that we are using them most effectively. But I, I really do want to say um, that our, our schools have really been um, they've really been helpful in working with us and, and understanding the importance of presenting a budget that we believe is reasonable and attainable. Um, and so this is what we've come with. The additional um, positions, the additional three positions are in operation. So there's a position for a driver trainer to work with in the transportation department um, and two additional maintenance personnel. We haven't really added any staff to the maintenance department since we opened Ken Island High School. Um, and that added 385,000 square feet of facilities that have to be maintained. So in addition to the demands for an electrician and the additional technology in the classrooms, we really do need that position. So those responsibilities have significantly increased. This, this slide shows our contractual obligations. We reviewed requests and evaluated our five-year trend data. We observed several areas that required increases in funding. Um, legal fees were one of those areas. While it's difficult to determine the need for legal representation from one year to, to another, our trend data indicated that um, the amount currently budgeted was not adequate to cover our cost. The same held true for maintenance contract for general contracts for general repairs to buildings, and next year additional water testing is going to be required, as you know. We've requested funds for a third-party administrator for our 403B and 457 plans uh, because state laws continue to become more complicated and this is a needed service. The largest increase in contractual obligations is for software um, licenses. Each year since we began the one-to-one -one initiative, we've been purchasing the software licenses at the end of the previous year, and we may not be able to accommodate that this year. There's an operational cost and should be added in our budget. So when we when we do things like um, uh, catch up on 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 line items or, or account for funding for line items that really are short with attrition funds and those kinds of things at the end of the year, we really are covering up structural deficits. So when we don't adequately budget for line items, we are creating a situation where we have to go find money and we knew we needed to go find money because it's not adequately addressing our needs. And we certainly don't want to continue that practice. The second largest increase under contractual obligations is bus contracts. The contract with the four bus companies requires an annual adjustment based on the increase in CPIU over a 12-month period from January to January. <coughs> that increase is 2.2 percent, which equates to a little more than $105,000. Legal fees, um, the current budget is 60000 and we wanted to increase that by 10000 to 70000 Bus contracts currently $5,160,000, and we want to increase it to $5,265,000. Uh, 
Our testing contracts um, currently are budgeted at 98,000 and we wanted to increase it to 122,000. Software licenses, we needed to increase that by uh, 280,000 and that's an increase of 210,000 because it's only budgeted at $70,000. Our maintenance contracts, repairs to buildings, and current budget is about 145,000, and we needed to increase that to 195. We've got the current the environmental testing for the water testing, um, and so we needed to increase that by 10,000. Uh, maintenance contracts, and that's for gym floors and things of that nature. The current budget is 60,000. We needed to increase it to 95,000. The third-party administrator that is a new line, and the <coughs> cost is $10,000. Under supplies and materials, again, based on our five-year trend data, custodial supplies have been um, over the current budget allocation for the last five years. Green cleaning, which is now a state regulation, is more expensive. And so uh, we also <coughs> want to pay for, from this line, uniforms and shoes for our custodial personnel. Other charges, the increase in insurance costs are based on the projections received from uh, MABE, as you all well know, the group insurance pool. Employee benefits, payroll taxes are calculated based on salaries and wages. Mileage is to accommodate the one cent increase in the approved IRS standard mileage rate. And of course, we have included a $15,000 line here for early college tuition um, because we're expanding our offering to of college courses and early college to students um, at the high school level which we shared a presentation last month. The next slide represents um, transfers. There is no increase in the equipment line. Uh, based on the costs associated with non-public placements and ages of students in those placements, we needed to increase the line item um, for this budget. And of course, the Midshore Special Education Consortium's FY18 budget proposal included an increase from the current amount allocated uh, for that service to continue that service, I should say. This is the summary of the last five slides. So the total overall increase to, to our budget is $5,401,767. And you can see that it, the costs are broken out for salary increases, or certainly that's the estimate. Um, the cost of a lost step, the 2.2% for folks at the top of the scale, contracted services, supplies, other charges, uh, no increase for equipment, and the cost for transfers. Okay, so uh, requested increase in unrestricted revenue. So that five billion that we talked about, 5.4 million that we just talked about in the last slide. Um, uh, state sources, the state aid, 329338 and local sources, which once again <laughs> represents fund balance, which we took from last year and need to replace. Then the uh, requested um, increase from the county is $5,336,842. Required increase in MOE is $1,389,120. So our request over MOE will be Three million nine hundred forty-seven dollars and seven hundred and seventy. I'm sorry, three million nine hundred forty-seven thousand seven hundred twenty-two dollars. So uh, at this point, you know, it, it becomes a a bit of a um, question: are, are we asking for growth or, or status quo? And I could say a lot about that, but what I will say is that across the state school superintendents are presenting their budget requests, and I, and I am part of that. Um, Queen Anne's County has pockets of poverty and suffers the ails similar to many other rural school districts. However, that's only part of our county story. The rest of the story boasts wealth, which was, is reflected in some of the slides that we just saw. It's reflected in the growth we see every day in this county. New courthouses built roads are repaired, there's plans for a new library to come to uh, fruition. Many facets of this county reflect that we are in growth mode. And that's great because we need to attract businesses for economic development, we need to boost real estate sales, and we need to continue to grow our wealth in this county. But what we are offering in terms of improving our schools uh, looks like a different story, right? It's 
2018, and this year represents the third year for which a request has been made for a computer science teacher at Queen Anne's County High School. That should not be. We talk about our motto, right, is we want to produce world-class students. In 2018, if we are to produce world-class students, we certainly have to offer them a pathway to learn computer science. That goes without saying. Kent Island High School has a great program for computer science, as they should. And the question becomes, is it equitable that we have one high school that has a program and not another? Now, this is not to say anything is wrong with Ken Island High School having that program, but what we're looking at is an, an equitable situation when we offer it at one school and we don't offer it at the other school. So we need to think about that. The community completed the budget survey this past fall, and those results were presented in January. Respondents clearly stated that they value low class size, more options for world classical languages, arts, and STEM programs for students. Um, but it is to my great disappointment that you do not see those programs specifically identified in this budget request because we want to certainly um, remain fiscally responsible we want to present a budget that is doable, but we have got to get ourselves to a position where we're able to offer our students new or improved programming in order to produce the students that we say we want to produce, which is world-class students. So moving forward in another day and time, we certainly want to be able to come back to those issues, those things that have been requested. We want to be sure that we are addressing our structural deficits that I mentioned a little bit earlier. When we fund lines that we know are inadequate, that presents a deficit, that we have got to get out of the practice of finding monies at the end of the year or hoping that we have attrition. And attrition really represents the difference in the salaries of maybe senior or tenured employees when they leave and, and the new ones that we hire that may not be at, a, at the higher salary. So we, it's not a good accounting practice to rely on those kinds of funds to fund our everyday line items. We absolutely must pay our employees. I began this budget process as a cheerleader to increase increase pay scales for support employees. Uh, as we know and was talked about earlier today by Ms. Fields, we have support employees that are below the poverty line, right? That should not be. Uh, I have spoken um, publicly about, you know, employees who are uh, making less than $10 an hour. These are employees with car payments and, and rent and mortgages, and we've got to do a better job of paying our employees. Uh, we have employees that work two and three jobs just to earn enough to, to pay their daily expenses. We have employees who are with us because of the in health insurance but it may not be meeting their needs. We have teachers and administrators that work endless hours and take time and resources away from their own family to do more for our students. And it's commendable. And, and we get into this because we have a heart for children and we want to do what's right for children. But we do have expectations that we need to pay our employees. Every single one of them uh, deserves more. And, and, and more, I wish we could give them what they really deserve, but in education across this nation, we don't pay our educators uh, what they really are deserving of. And I know that we don't always have funds to pay, um, you know, the steps and things that, that we want to pay, but it is my responsibility to request them. So what I presented to you are uh, our budget requests for fiscal year 19. Uh, now, what I committed to our uh, elected officials, you included, is that we will be transparent about what we have to do. And this is, this is the facts only. Please recognize that, the facts. What we will need to do should we only receive maintenance of effort. So our request was 3.9. $3,947,722. Uh, the new positions would be 700000 If we were not able to get all of our requests, the first thing I would do would be to cut out those eight new positions. And if I cut out those eight new positions, that would leave a balance of $3,247,727. Now, each teaching position 
averages about $85,000. So if you look at that $3.2 million and divide that by 87,000, the cost of a teacher, that would mean that 38 positions would need to be cut if we get only funding level to maintenance of effort. Now what we're talking about is not people, not positions that are vacant. So last year, the school district got into a, a position where they needed to balance the budget. And so uh, Mr. Paluski was able to um, cut some positions that were vacant. He cut some central office positions so that we did not have to go to uh, school positions. And I know there was a big um, controversy over the media specialists. But what I'm saying to you is that there is no possible way that we can find $3.2 million to balance our budget without cutting positions that living, breathing, mortgage paying, car payment paying people sit in today. So some areas that we have considered uh, or, or just have to be put on the table, certainly uh, most of them I, I would like to think are, are not a place that we'd have to resort to, but this, these are, these are some, some considerations. So of course some staffing reviews have to be done at all schools and, and if there are positions that are not fully utilized, then we certainly would need to cut some positions there with recommendations from principals. Health care coverage. Uh, we pay 100% of health care for some um, plans, and I would recommend a 90-10 premium sharing so that employees have some um, portion of that or 10% of that that they would have to pay. We would look at an um, option that you all looked at before, pay to play for athletics, uh, not funding a step, not funding COLA. Uh, delaying the implementation of salary improvements, looking at furlough days, um, and certainly, which is a minuscule amount, but admission fees for students attending athletic events. Just some ideas for cost savings that have been, uh, that should be considered. So let's look at our construction fund. So a facility assessment was done in May 2016, and um, already we are a bit behind what our, our plan, our 30-year blueprint, um, says that we need to do. So there are uh, multiple areas in which we received a uh, poor or failed rating, and those areas amount to about $1.2 million. There are some ADA upgrades that need to be made at some of our schools, um, in, some on, in the area of the um, parking lots, curb cutouts, signage. Um, there are some um, athletic buildings, gutters, downspouts uh, that affect the building shell. And there are windows, doors, there are multiple replacements, things that have to be uh, repaired. There's some site work having to do with asphalt, overlay, milling, um, drainage, and those kinds of things. Also, you're going to notice um, classroom technology. Our technology plan equates to about $1.3 million. It's actually $1,328,000. Um, and next year, we'll be in the fifth year of that technology plan. So we have to make some decisions about what we're going to do as we move forward for technology devices for our students. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, there are certain options that we certainly can look at, but there are about 2,200 devices for all of the middle school students plus the fifth grade at Sellersville Middle School and an extended warranty on teacher laptops for a year. So we're going to continue to work on that. There's no difference for leasing versus buying. I'm told uh, the leasing um, may cost us more, but uh, evidently it's a, a small difference. Most, but what it will do is it will uh, allow the opportunity for upgrades and to refresh um, devices that we do not, we would not have if we purchase them outright. So they're also considering, um, instead of the bags, which some of the kids hate and some of the parents because they have told me so, um, instead of having those bags to install um, drop tech cases, which uh, are certainly much more durable, we need to um, have an active directory um, and there's a labor, there's a one-time labor cost to set that up. Maryland legislative auditors recommended that we replace Novell with a single sign-on for one password for multiple logins. It helps to control security with fire 
firewalls, uh, software, security policies. Um, and uh, so those are, those are some of the, the things that needed to be considered when we look at our construction fund. Yeah. So where are we now? So um, right now we're looking at uh, county work sessions as we move forward. They're, they're noted on the slide, March 20th, 27th, 29th, and April 3rd. April 11th is currently the date the county commissioners um, plan to release their budget. Uh, May 23rd is the date for adoption of the final budget and the tax rates. And if you would also note, April 24th, 25th, and 26th are the scheduled public hearings for the county's budget. So this evening you've received financial data for Queen Anne's County, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, Queen Anne's County Public Schools revenue projection, expenditure projections, and our budget request for FY19. And I am going to um, seek approval for this budget request uh, following any discussion. And before we have discussion, I'm going to ask that uh, the other members of exec team join me with chairs so that we might be able to respond to any questions that you may have. Yeah, it's a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. distressing also. It yeah, stressful. yeah. It's the reality. Um, to sit here and to read all this. Um, it feels like a punch in the stomach. But well done. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, the public knows how many meetings this board has sat in and um, worked on this budget to cut it down when you, fir when you first gave it to us. Um, it was sickening then, it's even more sickening now. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's, so does anyone have any questions? Um, but I, I just have one question, I, I've forgotten. Um, your slide 26 is, has the um, required MOE, the state aid, and then the fund balance, Robin, I, what was we right. um, ahead, Last year, in order for us to balance our budget, um, at the very last moment, we had to take $264,000 out of our mm -hmm. fund balance in order to make the budget balance. Because we don't have that money or we're not putting that money up initially to cover that, then that's a reduction in resources for next year. Does that... If you look at the actual budget book on page three, it kind of shows that graphic. Well, I guess, um, not to put us in the middle of something here, but the, where does, um, we need to defend that, where does our, what does our fund balance sit at now? I mean, um, are we in, in actually, danger of? That was actually shown on one of the slides. Um, currently our fund balance is at $817,000. Um, which is less than 1% of our annual budget. And from an accounting perspective, that's really not very much to have in fund balance. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if we have a bad year as far as, you know, fuel, oh, okay. heating, those kinds of right. things. Right, and um, I guess that's You my know, having less than 1% is, is kind of <coughs> sad. Are we going to be in really bad trouble with the heating bill this year? I mean... Which oh, January was a very tough month. I mean, for for everybody, I mean, including electric heating, oil, it did spike up there. I mean, hopefully we're coming to an end and have a fairly decent spring and can can weather that part out. But it, it was a pretty rough uh, January. So I guess in that in that respect, it's we definitely need this 264 is is the point to right. be refunded back in. I just want to make a point of that because I know everybody's probably seen big bills on their electric from January. I sure did, so. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. I, I just want to 
say thank you to all of you guys. From when we first met and we had to start trimming the budget, you know, we'd come to the next meeting and solutions were found and resources were shifted and it was like, okay, well, we can get by without this position and we can do this. Um, how well you guys have worked together and um, your creativity at trying to meet the needs without um, being mindful of n possibly not being able to fund that new position and, and doing so. And the staff members who then have to kind of step it up because they don't, you know, there's no money to hire that extra person and how that translates to <coughs> our children, um, that's not lost on me. So this process being my first time at it um, from on this side versus, you know, being a parent of a student in the system um, is very impressive. And I appreciate all of the hard work that you guys have done to get to this point. Thank you. Do you have anything do you I, want to ask or? I, um, I'm not sure I feel comfortable at this point going to a vote. Um, I would like to motion to table that for us to have some more meetings and a few more discussions about <coughs> some of the items that we may not have had the opportunity to really do our best on. So I would like to move that we don't make a vote on this budget tonight. Understanding that, that is we absolutely understandable. Deadline, it is that a we lot. Have a deadline. I yeah. do realize that. Mm -hmm. So that's my motion that we um, postpone our budget approval pending further discussion. Okay. And Second. what I will be happy to do is to um, speak with the commissioners to find out if they could extend Jesus. our submission date from. Um, March the 13th, which is Tuesday coming up to a few days afterwards, so that it allows us an opportunity to meet again. All right, we have to vote on that though before we make that decision. So I second your motion. Okay. Okay, so um, make sure we get this all right. Um, we need to, we've, we have the motion, we have a second to do, um, to postpone the approval of the budget until we have further discussion, correct? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. And you'll be sending us a, a timeline of when we need to meet. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You need to tell Dr. Yeah. Kane. <coughs> I'm pretty sure. Was it something we said? Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> Everybody's leaving. Isn't <laughs> it? It's too late for jokes. <laughs> well, we're not done yet. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> We're all nice, but we're not that done was yet. Last budget here. It yeah. was just this last yeah. spring. Nobody's going to see it. Well, let's move on with this meeting. So we'll yeah. have to it's take care of you. Yeah. Thank you. We need to move on with our meeting. What's wrong? Because I went to the guest. They don't have it up to date. It's next year. So I went to the guest. Get to ask Karen to take her seat. Hey, Carrie, we need you, hon. We need to move this. No, no offense. We need to We need to move this meeting on so we can go home. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we need to move on to uh, 9.01, the HR report. May I have a motion to approve the HR report as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. In case we're going to move there. Yeah. Yep. We're moving past awesome. there. Okay. Um, so we're going to move to uh, 10.01 policies for second read. Substance use <coughs> policy, policy number 527, replaces drug and alcohol policy upon final approval. And policy development, policy number 110, replaces current policy on policies. 
Oh, my Lord. <laughs> okay. Was there any questions or comments, Mr. Farley? No, there were no comments on the board, uh, on the board web page. Uh, no questions whatsoever. And this will be a three-read process because uh, it's new and under the current policy process. Right. It's under the current one, which offers three reads. The new one will offer two reads. Okay, because okay, I'm reading two reads. I make a motion why. that we approve the substance use policy, policy number 527, and policy development policy, policy number 110, to go to the stakeholders for a second read. There, is it the, third? It says second read. It says here. second on here. This is the second read, yeah. right? So we're sending out for a third. Go. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got to get that straight. Why does it say second read? Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'll amend the motion to put out for the third read. I second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 10.02 policies for first read. Uh, first one is delinquent acts of a serious nature. Policy number 509 and regulation number 509.1, Mr. Engel. Two, the second one, political campaign materials policy number 631, Mr. Tolley. And uh, Madam President, we would just ask that these two policies move forward for first read for uh, the public to review and add comment. Okay. Is this May under the new? This will be under the new one, basically. Yeah, yeah. This would the timing. As far as the two reads. Yeah, yeah. The timing of this. By the time it is to be approved, it will be under the new policy. Yes. Um, because this has got to go out for 30 days, and in the meantime, the policy on policies, you know, will have been out for the third read. So by the time we get to okay. this one, it will go under the second read. Okay. So I need a motion to approve the delinquent acts of a serious nature, policy number 509 and regulation number 509.1, and the political campaign materials policy number 631 to go to our stakeholders for the first read. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The third is 10.03 uh, textbook approval. This is for grades six through eight in science. Madam, oh, I'm sorry. Madam President, we would just ask that 10.02, uh, our adoption process, which has been completed uh, by our science teachers, to put this out for public view of the materials for 30 days. Uh, to review and add comment, and then we would come back in 30 days and ask for approval. May I have a motion to approve the grade six through eight science textbooks to go to our stakeholders for the first read? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The next one is 10.04, the 2018-2019. What about Spanish and French books? Are those Did I miss something? No. Is that still on there? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. P. Yes. I, I, due to the absence of a supervisor of uh, languages, I'm working with those adoption teams. So we will bring that forward with the proper documentation in April for your consideration. Okay. So we got to make sure that's right. Thank you. These are, our agenda is on the different. computer. Is a, a different agenda than what we were handed. We got to make sure that they're synonymous. Oh, very okay. we're yeah. 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 See, we're reading off this and you're reading off there. Okay. So we'll, Sorry. we'll fix it. I see. Sorry. Okay. So we are going to move to the 2018-2019 and the 2019-2020 school calendar review. Dr. Pearson's coming forward. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So the calendar um, committee, along with the exec team, have um, 
went through and revised the calendar and have added um, a couple of um, revisions as well as um, deletions of half days to make sure that we had the adequate amount of professional development days. If you look at August, what we um, included there was the new teacher orientation, the 20th through the 24th. If you come down, there were no changes in September from the previous calendar. In October, October 18th was a half, um, half day teacher work day, and we made that a full teacher work day. Um, the other items that we um, looked at to provide more clarity was the closed summer hours. And you'll see those on uh, June uh, 2019, that would be the 28th, as well as during July 2019, the Fridays in that particular um, month. So uh, we are asking for approval of the 2018-2019 calendar with those slight um, revisions. It has already gone through for the 30-day approval. We've gotten feedback. We've met with our committee, and this is the um, calendar that we would like to present for approval. I have two questions. Um, number one, the, 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 the attachment provided to the board members in the calendar contains box doesn't have that language. I don't know. I can't even read the language right. that's up there. I have right. copies I can give you. And number two, why did we only build in three snow days? I mean, we've already exceeded five, and we've never just used three. That's because of the state requirement of three. And if you look at the box, I can give you copies so you can see sure, it a little like clearer. Sure, I'd like because my computer just that's died. Not what we that's not what we were given. Attachment. Right. Right. <clears throat> and this was already approved. Not on the commuter, commuter, not on right. The, it went through the 30 day. Okay, right. I'm clear on that. Yeah, we just okay. wanted to make sure that we were in line with the um, requirements for our professional development. Sure. That's gone. Okay. That's gone on the computer. That is not on the computer. I know. That's what I'm saying. But it's. It's what she's giving the public to a, for us to do is on there. <coughs> and it's on here too. Okay. I just All right. I, I so just I'm a little weird. We I'm want. a little wary of just three build in snow days and and also we've had discussion in past taking that. Okay, out. so if you look below where it says three built in snow days, yep. it has an explanation there. It says in the event of four snow days being used prior to January seventeenth, school will be in session on January 31st. Right, I understand that, that, but there's a history here. That, that. Right, there's a history here, and you, Three years ago, you don't we know, you don't, to. Miss Annette, or one second, yeah. was, and you probably don't know because you're new and, and you wouldn't have known about the history. Um, but that language was to be lim eliminated off of all calendars. Um, and and uh, that language, we have all agreed that that shouldn't be on there. Second of all, um, I just I have a real problem with just three three built-in snow days. Didn't we have four built-in snow days this year? And the, but the philosophy, I think we basically I think we got hosed by having four in this year. I mean, we we other counties put in the three, and because that's state mandated, state mandated right. three, we put in four to be responsible. But if we end up with having to have five, we're going to have to go get a waiver. We already I have think five. If all the, yeah, we have to get a yeah. waiver. I, I um, no, we, no, we to took an extra that. day. We yeah, took we an took extra day. day. So, yeah. so my thought is Correct. we'll do the three. We'll see where we stand. And if we have to ask for a waiver, we ask for a waiver for whatever days come after that. Because all the other counties are doing that. And uh, they're probably going to be granted mandated. because of the mandate to end June 15th. 15th. I think they're going to get Not this one. the days <laughs> like that instead of us going in and, you know, or if you don't get it, you don't get it, you go past the 15th. I mean, that's kind of where you are. So I, I don't know if we're using the right philosophy of trying to throw in more days because I think there's no way now we could ask for a waiver well, I'm, on any I'm, day over. I'm I'm okay with the three days, but I'm not okay with the language in there of using the days. Oh, Maybe we I need to talk about, yeah, I'm interested in your thoughts on the three Because three years days. ago we said that we okay. wanted that taken right. out I, of. I think that should definitely be And out. that's got to come out. But what so. do we do about the three days? Do we, do we put in four, do we put in five, and then, you know, our county is one of the only ones that will I was going to say, how many counties this year did kids. only three days? That, that I do don't we know. know that? Um, I do Dr. not have Pearson. that information. Yeah, I don't either. I, I do not. Okay, because we're we not going to approve this tonight anyhow. Okay. Because of that That's language fine. in there. 
Can you find that out for us? How many counties she didn't uh, did that. just three days of snow days in their calendars I will this research, year for us? I will research okay. to try and find and identify that. And the reason why this language was put back in is because of from the request the from the teachers on the committee. Okay. Yeah, well, it was so. we requested that taken out three uh, okay. years ago, and I don't want it back and in so, there first. Okay. So, and, and I think we all feel the same way about that. Okay. Yeah. I think we don't yeah. know when we right. can just use those days. It, it, just that's exactly it. it I mean, if you're going to have that language, you might as well have four, it wasn't four or five. Right. I mean, if we're going to include the language, what's okay. the difference? Yeah, okay. if, you, if with so, the language in there, that's there's so your two days yeah. right there. I'd rather yeah. not have it in okay. there. Okay, so. <laughs> so let's. We're not going to approve this. Am I correct? No, no. We're going to. And we're going to ask you to find out how many counties uh, in Maryland. I think we, we need to table this. Yes. until we get further information it's okay. not that we're not okay. approving it we're tabling exactly. discussion okay. so um, I'm probably not going to provide any more clarity I apologize because I was trying I'm to sorry. clarify that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. but the reason that that language is in there is because it shows good faith and well, part of the requirement for the waiver is that you show some good faith and mm -hmm. effort that you have right. tried to exhaust all of the days that you have possible to use, and that's why that's in there. Right. Um, so, if, but we if, can do that without the verbiage because we have these noted on here as holiday days. So what this what this does is it allows an opportunity for this calendar to get settled, and the the uh, board to not have to come back for a meeting to approve another calendar because parents will already know what the expectation is should we go over three snow days so that's why that's in here but even now, though we had that verbiage in there <coughs> this year for the 29th being used as an additional day of school to make up the fifth day we used mm -hmm. The question was, well, is the board going to vote like they did last year or the year before and change that anyway? And 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 that and it was and the point was it wasn't necessary. Right. It wasn't necessary right. for the board to come back and vote because you'd already voted on it. Parents know ahead of time. They know how to plan their schedule. If but that they happens, didn't. they didn't. Well, I'm they not sure how it was it. communicated before, but it certainly no, was communicated this year's this year's calendar, even with it saying we will hold school on March 29th in the event that we go over our snow days. And it may be because that was the first time understood. that it had been done. It was new. Um, if the it is no, the it board's was, prerogative. It, 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 it is quite a history here. It, yeah. it is the board's prerogative. So if it is not your will to approve that language, right. then you don't have to. Right. But I just wanted to provide some clarity on why that language is okay. in there. Well, so when we when we came on the board, that is what we heard from our constituents, that, that they, they did not work. want that verbiage on there. They, 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 un and of course, and it, there is a difference because we didn't have right. to be out of school exactly. by June 15th exactly. also. But I'd like to go back to some of them stakeholders and, and see what their opinion, if, if they want it back in there. Okay, so you certainly um, can do that, but I do want to say to you, there's not a whole lot of choices right. <laughs> for no, I, where we can where I we agree. can go, and especially since school really ends for students on June 14th, 14th and right. 19th. So we have even one less day right. that we're able to work with. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. we, what well, what is the will of the board? Well, another question is, I mean, you have two January dates. Most of our snow days come in February and, and sometimes <laughs> yeah. March. And and look and see and how many of those days that we have left I know, after then. I None. understand that, but do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> this year, it so happened that we had those days in January. Right. So if it happens next year, that's why we chose that, because there are no other days. Okay. So we'd have to ask for it. This is the process. So we'd have to ask for a waiver. Right. If we say, for example, got um, the fourth snow day on February the 4th or 5th or something like right. that after the January dates are done, then we'd have to request a waiver from the state. The state meets, I think, the third week in the month. If, if the snow happens before then, then that's great. We can request the waiver because it has to go to the state board. If it's after then, we're waiting till the next month. So we're waiting until the third week in March to know, and at that point there are zero days I think that left in the year this to choose. The, the process of requesting a waiver, this is the first year every county's really having to do it. So right. it's kind of an unknown. I mean, there's certain criteria set out there, but we don't know the we leniency on it. Yeah, we have. The only, bet, dif the only but, difference is the deadlines, is the uh, start and end dates for the mm -hmm. year, which right. makes things a little bit less flexible. Now, this last school board, uh, state board meeting, 
Um, I think Baltimore City and another district did get a day approved that was outside of the days that we normally would be able to get approved because there are not param there are not days mm -hmm. that school districts, not just Queen Anne's County, have after February. Did they get a waiver? They got a waiver? Baltimore did? They approved it, yes. Well, do we know how often waivers are being approved or not approved? That's what this we need year, to know This too. year is so different. Year this year is different right. because we because have the, the yeah. parameters order, right. of the executive order. Right. So start after Labor Day, start mm -hmm. right. before. It was uh, Western yeah. District was the other one because they wanted to start Garrett before. County. Garrett, Garrett. Garrett. Yeah. Yeah. Because they wanted to start before um, Labor Day and both of those were approved but they had certain conditions that they had to meet mm -hmm. in order to right. get that right. waiver well, they have requested. so much snow too right mm -hmm. and and so their it's a little bit no they were for starting before but the reason there they yes. was yes. was because yes. of the weather yes. conditions we really the, haven't yeah. seen any example of how the waivers are going to be handled for extra right. snow days exactly that's my point right. Right. right so dr maybe, pearson if, yes. if i could ask again maybe we need to <laughs> think through this a little if more. we could see how many counties um did the three days mm -hmm. and how many counties are asking for waivers or have asked for waivers okay is that is that is that good? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I don't think you're going to have an accurate number for the waivers because they usually apply for those at the end of the uh, yeah, year. Yeah, they wait until. That's why we the, did when this we year, had. This year, school yeah. districts did not wait because the snow came early. I understand that, but you're so still not going to have a, a, a specific accurate number if, with that number now for waivers is what I'm saying. Because there's still some that will right. do there's it. Still, and there's still a lot more snow to come in certain areas of, of the state, you know, and the – so. Yeah. Maybe we ought to, yeah, I, I, I recommend we that we, I, yeah, I yeah. recommend too that we, I'd like to find out how many went with three only. Yes, and that's, we need the, that's the big thing right we there. Is discuss the, the strategy yeah. of how we would work this yeah. based on the waivers that mm -hmm. have been given. Yes. That's so my if idea. You could, if you could find out. Um, and we may want to put that <coughs> language back in. If Maybe. that's it, right, depending on what we if find that out. shows good faith, exactly, and then the snow comes exactly. after mm -hmm. as it normally does. So, if so. you could find that out for us, how many how many have applied, or how many have three days built into their school schedules? Okay, and I'm interested in what their reasoning was if they got the waivers. And I can tell you from conversations with superintendents because that's all that is required. Mm -hmm. State mandated. Mm -hmm. But I think we're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. just to go with the minimum requirement. This has been a very mild winter, and we still went over by one day. We have a harsh winter, and we could see 10 snow days. Mm. And we've only uh, I uh, agree. put three in. Now we're scurrying around to find a replacement for seven days instead of just five. Getting your waiver. Well, we hope. I was getting ready to say because there's, there's no way. There's that, no days. There's no days to do it. That's which is right. exactly the calendar the is, right. is what no it is. Days. There are no days to do it. Right. There are certain days so, that you cannot ask okay. for a waiver. Right. And so I'm not sure even in developing the calendar, we can come up with enough I mean, days. Right. We, we struggled. Can we yeah, exactly. Days days four days. We right, exactly. Four so three days if you would do that, yeah. would you like to wait on the 2019-20 yes. calendar as well? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just allowing us to stay in school because for right. residents. Okay. I'm just wondering why we can't use residents. I'm just was wondering because one of the teachers was well, they did. About it. They the did in other counties. Why didn't, why didn't we use they it? Went and that's what their waiver day was. Well, first of all, they, yes, they, asked, if, they asked for a waiver for their kids to go to school on Monday to president's day. Yes. I'm glad we didn't because I'm out of town. But we wouldn't have gone anywhere else. Yeah, me neither. Okay, so we are going to thank you, Dr. Pearson. Um, so we are going to table that, correct? Yes. All right. So we're going to table 18 and 19 and 1920 until we. Yes. I make a motion that we table 2018-19 uh, calendar and 2019-20 school uh, until we get further information. A second okay. motion. I have a second. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. We're back to citizen participation and public comment. Uh, is there anyone that would like to come forward at this time that did not get to speak during the uh, first part? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, so now we're going to move on to future meetings and events.
Um, March 14th, we have a school board member orientation. On March 21st, we have a superintendent's mid-year conference. And uh, the next board meeting will be April 11th. Before we adjourn. Before we adjourn, just one. before we adjourn, thank you, uh, Mr. Baggio. I'd just like to take a moment to recognize the outstanding service of one of our exec team members who will be retiring prior to our next school board meeting. So I'd just like to recognize Ms. Robin Landgraf. So please. <laughs> out before that budget has to be done. <laughs> <laughs> so we congratulate you, Ms. Landgraf, yes, and we thank you for your many, many years of service, and we certainly hope that you enjoy the beach with the grandbabies, and, we, and we're going to call you anyway. So keep your cell phone <laughs> on you. Years? How many years, Ms. Landgraf? Uh, 30 plus. 30 plus. Whoa, that's the, that's the answer, 30, 30 plus. It's time for retirement, Ms. Landgraf. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> thank you so very much. <laughs> My um, question, when are we doing our budget discussion? I mean, um, I'm sorry. When is that on the 14th where we have this orientation? When are we Orient doing our we next budget discussion? We, ha we haven't planned that. We, oh, planned. we have it. Mm -mm. Okay. It's all right. Okay. So do we, we want got, we to got, do we that gotta, now? We've got to do or some do homework. We, it has to be. Uh, do. Do we want to do Put it now? your calendar. Grab your calendar. Oh, got mine. Oh, you mean set the date for a that's what session? You, that's what you meant, set, set the date, Is that right? what you're talking about? I mean, I, I think we need to, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, are we going to ask for an extension for the county, commissioner, county commissioners until we can get the... Okay, oh, we have one here. Before we have to present it to them? Is I, that, I, I think was that we the need intention? To, well, I think because y you need to meet. So right. we need to go ahead and, and plan that. That's and fine. I will request okay. Um, okay. an extension from okay. the commissioners. So we're looking at our calendar. Hey, anybody? Um, Are we? Could we do it? The four, was the fourteenth? Is that orientation? Is that the way. whole day orientation? I won't be here on the fourteenth. <laughs> no. The next available date I have is the sixteenth. Sixteenth. Mm-hmm. Which a is on a Friday. I can't do a half day school. Well, unless we did morning. Do we do nine a.m.? I can do morning about, all day. Well, we have to worry about Carrie here. I got. <laughs> I probably have people scheduled. Um, a day. Uh, Mr. Maggio was suggesting the 16th, did you say? 16th, yes. I can, I can even actually do it Friday morning if we have to. It is Friday morning, the 16th. No, no, the following. I mean, this Friday morning, if no one has any plans. I have a superintendent's of, meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's too place for Carrie, so. I can't, yeah. That's too much. Oh, on the 16th? I can reschedule people on the 16th. It's not fair that to would give that you enough Friday. notice? Yeah, I don't like to do it, but I can. Captain Kelly? What time? 16th, I'm good. What time? Nine in the do we want to do? What's easier for you? Yeah, um, it's a half a day, so do we want to do 9 a.m.? Or is it? You're you're coming back by then? Or you're oh yeah, I'll be back on the um, 15th. Is where, Carrie, what works around your schedule? Then? That's what we're we trying seem, to figure. Yeah. Later I would have than to that. Pull up my schedule. Um, should we do this? Yeah, go ahead. So you're okay first thing in the morning. I'm good in the morning. You okay, Dr. Keene, in the morning on the 16th? Yes. Rearrange what I have. No okay. Worries. I'm, I'm good for this. You're okay? Mm -hmm. Sharon? Uh, okay. And so then would we even need an extension? Yes. Mm -hmm. Drink it. Don't drink my water. You're always sick. <laughs> <laughs> so are we saying this? Well, it's not like they don't have the information. They were here. So, so are we saying the 16th at what time? 9 a.m. We're waiting, waiting to on see Carrie. what Carrie. Oh, okay. Just logging into my. Okay. Now you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I need to stop strong in my water tonight. <laughs> hey, we need some caffeine in that thing. Yeah. What was the deal with the um, Spanish and the French books? That you just haven't had a chance to meet with the supervisors. Is that why we that was postponed? Because because there is no supervisor. 
I've become the supervisor. So that's other duties as assigned. Uh -huh. So well, I was going to say we have we have Mrs. Rosario back there, yeah. and I bet she came here just for that, didn't 16, she? Sixteen. Sixteen. Oh, okay. What'd she say? <laughs> she did not. Some, some books with me. If I knew that I was going to do, I would have maybe a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done it for us, couldn't you? I can, I can talk about the books. Right now, but, uh, we'll we'll have we'll have it prepared for you for the April okay. meeting. Okay. Could, could we meet at one? on the 16th Jen can't because that's can't. however I wait do you need a babysitter because no <laughs> 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 Sarah. Sarah's Sarah's like, like, how do I get Sarah's Sarah's so nice. I want Anthony too because <laughs> yeah, that's a job and I am yeah um, okay, I, so I can do work. between 9 and 12 I prefer to do after 1 <laughs> Nine and 12 it's up to you guys I, I can't be there after you know, I can do morning, but other than that, I can't. I mean, if that's... I can... That's fine. Between 9, we'll be done. Was no. there another day that's better for you? Well, we could do it 9 to... We're already We could do it 9 to 11. Well, we could do it 9 to 11. I mean, yeah. I mean, is there is there a better... If I we're going to ask for an extension, I mean, you know, we can... We can on the 15th, between 11 and 1. She's not going to be here. She oh. won't be back until the 15th. So what's another day? Um, the 19th is Monday. I guess because the 16th is Are a Friday. Are you talking about right? March, That's Annette? Or yeah. We were yeah. looking at April. I have an unexpected yeah. okay. trip that right. I'm making this week. What about the 19th? So Monday. I could do Monday the, in the morning. Yeah. Why not? The 19th in the morning. Mm -hmm. how, do, how does that look for you, Kate? How about you, Dr. King? I can rearrange my exact team meeting. That's fine. Okay. I can't do that. Um, I, why don't we go back to the 16th and okay. go between 9 and 12? That's fine. Does that work? Well, we can do it between 9 and 11. I think we, we can do it in two do, hours. We usually only do three hours. But well, we don't do three hours because an part hour of that is lunch. lunch. Right. That's well, fine. not an hour. But does 9 to 11 work? Yes. I will, 11. I will block those two okay. hours off. Okay. All right. So right on the 16th okay. from 9 to 11. Budget work session. Budget work session. Okay. Okay. Did you get that, Miss Jackie? Uh, and I you're okay. Nine like to uh, nine to eleven. Got it. I'll probably be here like nine oh five. You're okay. Nine, nine to eleven. Mm -hmm. Everybody over here is okay. Nine to eleven. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. So I guess uh, we are at adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Thank you and good night. <laughs>